Well, good afternoon. I'm Rick Lifton, president of the Rockefeller University, and I can't tell you how thrilled I am and all of us are to welcome everyone to the 65th convocation of the Rockefeller University. I'm delighted to see Casbury Auditorium so filled on this uh, joyous occasion today. If this is your first visit to Rockefeller, we're a different kind of university. We don't have undergraduates, a law school, or an English department, or a basketball team. Instead, we have a single and vital mission, science for the benefit of humanity. For centuries, the conduct of science, seeking to understand the natural world by careful observation, formulation of potential explanations, and rigorous and relentless experimental testing of these ideas to see if they stand up to critical tests when performed by us or by any other objective party, has proved to be by far the most reliable way to distinguish explanations of the natural world that are true from those that are false. Rockefeller strives to recruit a relatively small number of the world's most creative faculty, just 70 in all, who have the potential to crack critical problems in biomedicine, and we provide them with ex an exceptional environment in which everyone on campus is focused on advancing our mission, generous resources, and undistracted time to develop their laboratories and to do their best work. The results of this clarity of mission speak for themselves. As but one measure since our founding, 26 of our professors have received the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Chemistry. As there have only been 255 professors in our history, more than 10% of the professors in our history have received a Nobel Prize. This includes seven in the last 24 years. This is a total not matched by any other institution, regardless of size. Recognizing the importance of training future generations of great scientists to have big thoughts coupled to experimental execution, in 1955, Rockefeller became a PhD granting university, and graduates of our program have since gone on to highly impactful careers at the world's leading universities in the biotechnology and pharmaceutical industries and in other areas of commerce in which strong analytical skills are prized. 
The goal of our PhD uh, program is to promote in our trainees the curiosity and scholarship to identify important problems, to help them develop the knowledge necessary to develop experimental approaches, to test their ideas uh, uh, designed to choose solve, uh, solve chosen problems, as well as the technical and analytical skills that are critical to completion of their projects and PhD thesis. We also hope we develop in our graduates the love of pursuit of new truths about life on this planet and the remarkable thrill of discovering something new about the secrets of life, made deeper by the knowledge that we collectively are adding to the remarkable body of knowledge about life on this planet and that these insights are contributing to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of human disease. We trust that our graduates <clears throat> go on to use these skills to further the overall health of our society and the planet. The evidence of the importance of ensuring an enduring pipeline of well-trained biomedical scientists has, of course, been on full display during the PhD careers of this year's graduates. The application of lessons from fundamental science proved crucial to the unprecedented speed of the development of the highly effective vaccine against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's a spectacular demonstration of the power of science and has prevented severe disease and death in many of our loved ones. And nonetheless, so many people in our country <clears throat> and around the world died from widespread misinformation about the virus and vaccine, not to mention inequality and in access to its benefits. For all these reasons, we hope and expect that this year's graduates will become critical voices in our society, promoting the importance of truth and facts in science and other lines of inquiry. Although the skills of our graduates have been honed working in academic biomedical science, they will be useful in any enterprise and in any forum in which an inquisitive mind and exceptional analytical skills are of value. The path of this year's graduating students has certainly not been easy. The abrupt arrival of COVID, not just in New York City, but at our neighboring institutions at the corner of 68th and York Avenue three years ago, was tremendously disruptive to their lives and their ongoing research, it coming in the most critical time of the conduct of their theses. And yet, these students not only persevered, but redoubled their efforts, in many cases continuing to work on their own projects and contributing to the biology, diagnosis, and treatment of COVID-19 all while working in a challenging environment with limitations on time in the lab and disconnect from the usual social interactions. This year's students have succeeded greatly in working in 70 of the best laboratories of the world in highly diverse areas of biomedicine and will carry forward a more immediate understanding of the critical importance and urgent value of science to our society than most who came before and who will come to follow. We trust that our graduating students have learned that the curiosity, creativity, and passion needed to learn something new about how life works on this planet is both a treasured talent and that success in making such discoveries is endlessly thrilling and also carries with it the responsibility to inform others about the importance of uh, pursuit of truth. Today we are immensely proud to be conferring the PhD degree upon 36 graduating students, a truly exceptional group who have been integral members of our community, of scholars, and who through their inspiration and hard work have become outstanding scientists in their own right. Following the extraordinary challenges of the last three years of the pandemic, we have experienced a remarkable rebirth as the virus has at last receded and life in our labs and on campus have returned uh, toward normal, both on campus and in this great city and around the world all have returned to something approaching a new normal. The return to normal activities has been met with relief, pride, and joy here on campus. Today's convocation is a wonderful celebration of the accomplishments of our students, and I can't think of any better way to look to the future. Our convocation is also the occasion on which we recognize individuals for exemplary contributions to the advancement of science and the betterment of humanity. We do this to honor these individuals for their remarkable achievements, but as importantly, we do this to present these distinguished individuals to all members of our community and the world as exemplars of the impact one can have through a life dedicated to science, pursuit of truth, and service to humanity, and to provide a standard to which we can all aspire. 
This afternoon, we will confer the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa upon three individuals who are extraordinary exemplars of the Rockefeller credo and who are inspirations to all of us, Evelyn Lipper, Mark Kirshner, and Ingrid Dobshi. I'll have much more to say about them later in the program. We're here today thanks to generations of leadership by the Rockefeller family, with our graduate program being uniquely attributable to the dedication of David Rockefeller. David recognized the importance of educating new generations of scientists, and he understood that these young scientists bring energy and new ideas to our own laboratories. David was committed to the graduate program's success and involved in every aspect of its development. Our graduate program proudly bears his name. Because of our small size, we thrive without departments and disciplinary boundaries. This allows our students to be Im immersed in a highly interactive environment, and they learn from incredible scientists working in diverse areas with very distinct technologies and approaches, and they also learn from one another. Nonetheless, their closest collaborator is their mentor, and we're very proud of the keen commitment that our heads of laboratory uh, give to the success of their students. This commitment stands at the heart of the graduate program. Today's ceremony highlights this relationship as the achievements of each graduating student will be celebrated by their faculty mentor. Our graduates today, like their predecessors, have learned science by doing science. And as you'll hear this afternoon, they have been remarkably creative and productive. We are immensely proud to graduate them into the Academy of Rockefeller Doctorates. Good afternoon and welcome, Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, graduates, Rockefeller community, and honored guests. This ceremony is part of our unique tradition at Rockefeller of focus on our graduating students. I now give my formal assurance as dean to the president and to the board that these graduates have satisfied their obligations and are eligible to be conferred the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Noma Adaku completed her undergraduate studies at Yale and conducted her thesis work in my lab as a Tri-I MD-PhD student. A major challenge in oncology is identifying the patients who are at risk for metastatic spread of their cancers. For decades, the conventional wisdom has held that certain cancer cells within tumors acquire changes to their DNA called mutations that allow them to metastasize. However, despite major tumor sequencing efforts, such metastasis driver mutations have not yet been identified, suggesting that alternative mechanisms may be at play. Noma's graduate work provided evidence supporting an alternative hypothesis, that pre-existing differences in our inherited genes may be the underlying cause of metastatic spread. In her first project, Noma joined forces with another scientist in the lab, Ben Ostendorf, to show that the same melanoma cells injected into mice of slightly different genetic backgrounds led to starkly different metastatic outcomes. They implicated a gene called APOE in this process. Humans have three versions of this gene called APOE2, APOE3, and APOE4. Each of these forms of APOE differ from one another by one or two amino acids. Such changes impact the function of this protein by influencing how well this protein binds to receptors on cells. They used mice that were born with each of these distinct forms of human APOE and studied how melanoma cells grew and metastasized. They found that the type of APOE gene these mice inherited from their parents strongly influenced how quickly the tumors grew and how efficiently they metastasized. Noma then took these studies to the next level in her thesis project by generating mice that developed genetically induced melanomas and which harbored each of these distinct human APOE genes. These studies involved massive numbers of mouse genetic crosses. Noma found that indeed, different forms of the human APOE genes led to large differences in the numbers of metastases that formed. She also discovered that one form of APOE, called APOE2, increased the activity of ribosomes, which produce proteins in cells, providing one explanation for why these cells might metastasize more efficiently. Noma's work provides a solution to a long-standing conundrum in the field by providing the first fully genetic evidence that specific human genetic alterations can regulate cancer progression and metastatic spread in an animal model, and that these genetic alterations are heredity, 
hereditary and predate the tumor. Interestingly, the APOE4 gene is known to increase risk for Alzheimer's disease. NOMA's findings in melanoma reveal that APOE4 is protective against melanoma metastasis, revealing the disease risk benefit trade-off conferred by our inherited genetics. NOMA is an exceptional experimentalist. During her training, she became an expert in cancer biology, mouse genetics, and protein translation. She's a bold scientist, an outstanding teacher, and a major advocate for social justice causes. Noma, I'm excited for the next chapter of your career as you finish your clinical electives and begin your medical residency training. I'm sure that will be as fulfilling as this last chapter. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Noma Adaku. I'm now delighted to present to you Renan Aparicio. Renan was born in California to parents who had fled their university studies of engineering in El Salvador to escape the savage civil war there in 1980 and 81. Renan grew up outside LA. He was an outstanding student and soccer player, and he was accepted and attended UC Berkeley. He was captivated by biochemistry uh, in a course taught by Randy Sheckman an uh, investigator we all know uh, as uh, an individual who won the Nobel Prize for his work describing the pathway by which proteins are exported from cells. And Renan persuaded him to take uh, him into his lab. Bitten by the science bug, he stayed on in Randy's lab after graduation, and through his work saw the beauty of science and the possibilities for science to have profound impact on human health. This led him to apply and gain admission uh, to the Tri-Institutional MD-PhD program, a joint program of Rockefeller, Weill, Cornell, and Sloan Kettering. I was delighted that he chose to work in my laboratory. In the lab, Renan took on the analysis by whole exome sequencing of the genomes of more than 500 patients that we had uh, recruited over many years with abnormalities in blood le electrolyte levels of potassium, calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonate. These are electrolytes that are essential for normal neuromuscular function. He identified causal mutation in 10 different genes causing these phenotypes that increased our understanding of disease pathogenesis via both the varied genetic mutations and the clinical features seen in affected patients. His work also, and most critically, addressed a fundamental question in human genetics that is particularly relevant for clinical diagnostics uh, and pursuit of new understanding. The protein coding region of our 20,000 genes comprise only 1% of the DNA in our genomes, and it has long been debated how often mutations that knock out the function of genes lie in these coding regions versus sites outside them, the other 99% of the genome, which includes enhancers and promoters that are known to regulate gene expression. He addressed this question by studying 200 unrelated individuals with one of these rare electrolyte disorders called Gittleman syndrome, a disease with unusually stereotypical abnormalities. Every known patient with this disorder, uh, an inherited disorder, has low blood potassium, high blood bicarbonate, low blood magnesium levels, and low urinary calcium levels. Everyone who has this has uh, two mutations that knock out the function of this single gene on both of its copies. Uh, this is a gene that encodes a renal thiazide-sensitive sodium chloride cotransporter. Because of this biochemical profile, uh, on it only results from mutations in both copies of a single gene. All patients with this biochemical profile should have two mutations in this gene. So we were interested in what is the distribution between mutations in the coding region versus mutations anywhere else in the genome that might regulate the expression uh, of this gene. So this provided a great opportunity to determine these uh, frequencies. From exos exome sequencing, sequencing just all the genes, two mutations were found in 183 of these 200 patients. 
and only one mutant allele was identified in 17 patients, strongly implying that there must be a second allele somewhere that is going to cause the other uh, uh, 17. Whole genome sequencing was performed in each of these patients, and likely mutations were identified. Thirteen of these were splice mutations in the splice acceptor polypyrimidine tract upstream of the canonical uh, acceptor site for splicing. One was a duplication uh, of the splice acceptor site that created a frame shift mutation. Two introduced a new splice donor site deep within the introns, and one created a putative transcriptional repressor site deep in an intron, which was supported by expression analysis in cell culture. No promoter or enhancer mutations were identified. This study provides a clear demonstration of the rarity of mutations that have large effects on gene expression uh, as having large effect uh, in uh, this population and places uh, limits not just for this gene but has implications for other genes as well. Renan went on to study a number of families with unexplained electrolyte disorders. The most interesting of these was a one-of-a-kind family with severely low blood magnesium level due to impaired reabsorption of this electrolyte by the kidney. Affected members all had a novel mutation in a tRNA encoded not in the uh, nuclear genome, but in their mitochondria that was passed on to all of the offspring of mothers who carried the mutation. This family is also distinctive in that all mutation carriers have an unusual range of neuropsychiatric disorders that have not yet uh, been understood. While I could go on, I note that Renan came to the lab with substantial wet lab experience, but no experience in bioinformatics, entrusting the study of 500 uh, genome analyses uh, to uh, a, a novice uh, in the field uh, was unusual, but uh, he proved to be such a quick study and was so adept in analyzing, annotating, and interpreting large sequencing data sets, I was confident that he would succeed, and he did. He remained incredibly focused in advancing his project throughout the pandemic and did truly outstanding uh, work. Outside the laboratory, uh, we bonded over the U.S. efforts in the World Cup, uh, disappointed by their loss to Netherlands, Ticha, uh, and, uh, uh, but nonetheless, I, I had a very good time. Uh, and we both have, he have national team jerseys. So. so uh, also outside the laboratory, uh, he met, courted, and married uh, his wife, Stacy, who, along with uh, Renan's parents, are here with us uh, today. Renan is a joy to work with. He's intellectually curious and rigorous, well-prepared, and a wonderful speaker. He has now gone back to the wards to complete his medical training, and this fall will be applying for residency in internal medicine with a plan to pursue a career as a physician scientist. I look forward to following his career development and know he will do great things in his future endeavors. Mr. Chairman, colleagues, distinguished guests, it is now my great pleasure uh, to introduce you to Renan Aparicio. Tatsuya Araki. So I'm reading comments uh, written by Gabrielle Victora. Tatsuya uh, was the first person to join my laboratory, Gabrielle's laboratory, at Rockefeller. Um, and he even went through the trouble of rotating in uh, Gabrielle's lab while uh, Gabrielle was still at MIT. In fact, he joined an empty lab space here for several months uh, before uh, Gabrielle arrived. And in this sense, uh, Tatsuya was key to the seamlessness of uh, the, the lab's move, uh, receiving reagents and helping with the general lab setup in a way that sped up the transition. Tatsuya's work in the lab began with an effort to engineer complex mouse models to quantify the effects of changes of various magnitudes in antibody affinity uh, on B cell selection in germinal centers. By no fault of Tatsuya's, uh, this effort ultimately failed. 
But this is one of the clear examples of instances in which failure can perhaps work out better than success. Tatsuya is a deep thinker. While scanning through hundreds of sequences to find affinity gain mutations with which to make engineered mice, he realized that maybe the information we needed was there in the natural germinal centers themselves and that all of the complex engineering that we were attempting wasn't really necessary. This led to a large-scale exploration of how affinity-enhancing mutations are selected in unmanipulated germinal centers, which has fundamentally changed my, Gabriel, <laughs> understanding of how affinity maturation operates. Um, his success in pivoting from frustration to insight in such a manner is a testament to Tatsuya's patience, resourcefulness. With this work under his belt, Tatsuya was quickly recruited, actually well before defending, to work at Pfizer, where he now aids in their efforts to use affinity maturation to design more and more potent antibodies. So thank you, Tatsuya, for your exceptional science and other contributions to the lab. Looking forward to the exceptional antibodies that will no doubt be coming from Pfizer in the coming years. Um, <laughs> President Lifton, Chairman Ford, honored guests, it's a pleasure to present Tatsuya Araki for his degree. All right, settle in, everyone. Uh, as you may have noticed from the program, 10% uh, of these students uh, here are from my lab. So you're, you're going to hear a lot from me. So it is my uh, pleasure to present Barbara Bosch for her doctoral degree from the Rockefeller University. Barbara grew up in Belgium and came to Rockefeller as a PhD student after completing an undergraduate degree in MD at KU Leuven in Belgium. Barbara undertook a PhD project uh, with the aim of identifying promising new drug targets in the bacterial pathogen Mycobacterium tuberculosis, which is responsible for causing TB. So antibiotics uh, target the products of essential genes but rarely achieve complete target inhibition, and thus the all-or-none definition of essentiality afforded by more traditional genetic approaches like gene knockouts fails to, to discern some of the most attractive uh, potential antibiotic targets, uh, those whose incomplete inhibition results in major fitness costs. So in contrast to the binary definition of essentiality, Barbara sought to develop the concept of gene vulnerability. Gene vulnerability is a continuous quantifiable trait that relates the magnitude of inhibition, gene inhibition to the effect on bacterial fitness. So in this framework, essential genes exist along a gradient of vulnerability that reflects the uh, fitness cost of graded gene silencing or inhibition. To quantify gene vulnerability and identify potentially attractive antibiotic targets, Barbara developed a novel functional genomics method in TB. This approach involved titrating gene knockdown in the bacterial pathogen to find the breakpoint for every gene, that is, how much gene inhibition is needed to impose a fitness cost on the bacterium. Her research revealed significant variations in vulnerability among bacterial pathways and even individual steps within pathways, challenging the conventional notion of gene essentiality as a binary trait. Barbara identified key rate-limiting steps in bacterial physiology, including highly vulnerable steps in central dogma processes, cell wall synthesis, protein secretion, protein folding and proteolysis, cell division, and unexpected pathways not typically considered important for rapid bacterial growth. Equally significant, she identified invulnerable essential genes, which might explain previous failures in drug discovery efforts. Her work provided a roadmap that is actively being used to prioritize new targets for TB drug discovery. Barbara will now embark on a new endeavor as a clinical scholar in the labs of Seth Darst and Liz Campbell. Barbara's wisdom, compassion, and passion for her work have left a profound impact on the culture of our group. Uh, we will all miss her dearly but we are confident that she has a brilliant future ahead of her. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Barbara Bosch.
All right, round two. Uh, so I'll read these remarks on behalf of Howard Hang. Uh, so good afternoon. Uh, congratulations to all the graduates and their families today. It is uh, my pleasure to present Victor Chen for his doctoral degree from the Rockefeller University. Victor joined uh, my laboratory, Howard's laboratory, to investigate how specific bacteria in our gut modulates our immune response to pathogens and promotes immunotherapy to cancer. Uh, work from my laboratory and others around the world have begun to identify specific bacterial, uh, beneficial bacterial species, but our ability to characterize and understand the functions of these bacterial species was limited by the availability of robust genetic methods. Especially for our bacterial species of inter interest, Enterococcus faecium, a prominent member of the microbiota of humans. To, to tackle this problem, Victor was inspired by the advances in CRISPR gene editing from the Marafini and Rock Labs at Rockefeller and was able to develop new and improved genetic editing methods for Enterococcus faecium. The remarkable advances from Victor has allowed my laboratory to genetically investigate key pathways in Enterococcus that are important for their growth and modulation of immune pathways in mouse models. Beyond this effort, Victor has also been instrumental in teaching new members of my lab the methods he pioneered. This work was not a trivial task as my laboratory moved from Rockefeller to Scripps Research in San Diego during the pandemic. Despite this spatial divide, Victor's methods are now readily executed in my lab, highlighting the robustness and utility of his innovations, as well as Victor's generosity in teaching others. In my absence, Jeremy Rock graciously offered to host and co-mentor Victor at Rockefeller for him to finish his thesis studies, where he has continued to develop larger scale genetic approaches to investigate Enterococcus faecium. This work has led to several publications for Victor already, with more to come in the future. Uh, I would like to thank Jeremy Rock and Luciano Marafini for, <laughs> uh, you're welcome, Howard. Uh, Victor has been an exceptional and highly independent graduate student. His scientific achievements and generosity with others uh, are going to have a significant impact on our field. I am thrilled that he has obtained an exciting research scientist position at CRISPR Therapeutics in the Bay Area, where he is poised to make important contributions and also be close to his family. Uh, finally, I would like to co congratulate Victor on his terrific graduate studies and thank him for his terrific contributions to my laboratory. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guest, it is my pleasure to present to you Victor Chen. So at Rockefeller University, I've had the pleasure to mentor truly special young scientists throughout their graduate education. In many different ways, they've shined as rising stars. Christopher Cowley is unique in that he was already shining when he joined my laboratory. Chris grew up on a farm in South Africa where he got his first taste of biology with bigger cats in his backyard than we have in ours. <laughs> By the time he was in high school, it was clear that, Ki that Chris was gifted in both science and in swimming. When Chris received a full athletic scholarship to swim and perform his undergraduate studies at Ohio State University, he had his chance to come to the US and begin his upward trajectory here. After receiving his bachelor's degree, Chris began working as a research technician with Dr. Michael Greenberg at Harvard Medical School, where he probed how cells respond to stress to activate specific genes. Chris's work led to a fundamental discovery that certain transcription factors, called AP1 factors, are stimulated by stress, where they recruit a chromatin remodeling machine that's necessary to transcribe the genes that are important in protecting our cells from stress. This experience sparked Chris's curiosity about how tissue stem cells cope with stressful situations. 
Chris joined my laboratory at the cusp of our discovery that the stem cells responsible for rejuvenating and repairing our skin retain memories of their experiences, somewhat similar to what happens in our brain. In response to a stressful situation, the stem cells develop a memory within their nucleus that endows them with the ability to heal wounds faster and display broader resistance to pathogens than ever before. Teaming with another graduate student in the laboratory, Chris brilliantly tackled and discovered how this memory is established, how it's maintained, and how it's recalled. This landmark study was published in a major scientific journal, and it serves today as a paradigm for how other tissues of our body remember and recall our experiences. The brain is not unique in that regard. Chris's findings have broad implications for therapeutics, aimed at chronic inflammatory disorders, and also for cancer prevention. The work also landed Chris a prestigious National Institute of Health fellowship that has covered Chris's graduate training and now continues to do so for his postdoctoral training, where he's studying now at Sloan Kettering, studying inflammation and colon cancer. Chris exudes unparalleled intellectual curiosity, scientific drive, and fearlessness. On top of it all, he continues to swim competitively in New York, where he does everything with a smile, an upbeat attitude, and an irresistible personality. Chris, I came back from a scientific meeting out of town in order to be able to be here today to personally congratulate you. I wish you the very best for what I'm sure will be a very exciting future for you. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Christopher Cowley. When Aaron Gupta approached me to discuss his interest in joining the lab for his thesis work, he was quick to point out the risks he was taking. After all, he said, it's been over 25 years since a student ventured into the Ravitch lab to pursue PhD research. Having thus been put on notice, I recognized I wasn't dealing with just any student. Aaron came to the Tri-IMD PhD program with impressive credentials. He completed his bachelor's degree at Berkeley in bioengineering, with a focus on computational and synthetic biology, integrating engineering techniques into cellular biology. This formidable start was followed by a stint at Genentech, where he worked on the inflammasome in the laboratory of Vishva Dixit, publishing several high-profile papers that revealed critical aspects of lethal sepsis. The issue then wasn't whether he was ready for the lab, but whether the lab was ready for him. Aaron hit the ground running, and despite the influency delays due to COVID, he completed a monumental amount of work in only three years, establishing new paradigms for how we understand the role of antibody glycosylation in regulating the immune response. He developed novel mouse models, solved vexing structural problems, and raised the bar for all of us in the lab by integrating computational methodologies in approaching biological questions. I'd like to highlight one aspect of his work, since it's indicative of his tenacity, intellect, and personal commitment to tackling big problems. The lab had identified a critical role for a conserved glycan on the FC domain of IgG antibodies and established that glycosylation modulated both the structure and function of antibodies, establishing a novel mechanism for diversification of antibody function. These experiments that went into these studies were time-consuming and difficult, involving mass spectroscopy to analyze the glycan structure and sophisticated biochemistry to prepare pure preparations of antibodies with defined glycans. Aaron, working closely together with his fellow MD-PhD student, Kevin Cow, who I'll introduce shortly, decided to find a better way. They recognized that yeast display libraries 
constructed from synthetic camelid antibody sequences, might possess the necessary specificity to distinguish closely related glycans, differing by only a single sugar in the context of the FC backbone. They set up screens, sorted and resorted the libraries, and came up with exactly what they had predicted would be present. Identifying these nanobodies was certainly a coup, but it wasn't enough to satisfy Aaron and Kevin. They wanted to know the structural basis for this specificity and turned first to AlphaFold, the AI program that predicts protein structure. Turns out, AlphaFold wasn't up to the task, despite its hype. The structural prediction generated by the AI made no sense. So crystallography was required. And for the next year, after multiple attempts and failures and a less than enthusiastic mentor, they finally obtained crystal that diffracted beautifully, allowing them to solve the structure of the first FC glycan specific nanobody in complex with its target. It was a true tour de force, opening an exciting new approach to studying protein glycan interactions and proving that taking big risks can sometimes pay off. The lab continues to use these reagents developed by Aaron and Kevin, allowing us to rapidly characterize the role of FC glycosylation in multiple disease states. As my mentors Norton Zinder and Peter Modell taught me over 50 years ago when I was a student in this institution, our mission in the lab is not just to expand on what is known, but to open up new fields of investigation and illuminate what is possible in our efforts to understand the complexities of biology. Aaron demonstrated that rare ability and will be continuing to bring his formidable talents to bear on problems of medical importance. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Aaron Gupta for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Taylor Hart is a true New Yorker. She grew up upstate and received her undergraduate degree from Hunter College before joining our PhD program in 2015. As a graduate student in my lab, Taylor took on a pie in the sky project, a project that only the absolutely best students might have some chance to pull off and that a halfway reasonable postdoc would probably never touch. <laughs> the humble goal was to transform the field of ant neuroscience. Ants, as most of you know, show amazingly sophisticated social behaviors, especially considering that they are proverbially small insects with relatively simple brains. Therefore, ants feature prominently as study systems in ethology. However, while Drosophila neuroscience has advanced so dramatically over the past decades, ant neuroscience has essentially been stuck. So here comes Taylor. To implement modern neurogenetic tools, she had to create the first ever transgenic ants. As you can imagine, that's not an easy task, and there are in fact good reasons why nobody had done this previously. Amazingly, however, Taylor succeeded, and a couple of years into her project, she had made several transgenic lines, one of which expressed the genetically encoded calcium indicator GCAMP in the olfactory system. The second challenge was to develop a protocol to image neural responses as the ants perceive pheromones, the chemical signals they use to communicate. This challenge, substantial under normal circumstances, was greatly exacerbated by the COVID pandemic. However, Taylor ultimately overcame this hurdle as well and established an efficient protocol to perform functional imaging in the ant brain. This allowed her to make several seminal discoveries. For example, she identified a sensory hub in the ant brain that responds to alarm pheromones, signals the ants use to alert each other to danger. She also found that the neural representation of these pheromones changes qualitatively yet systematically as the ants age. This could help explain a central organizing principle of ant societies the division of behavioral tasks in an age-dependent manner. Several lab members are now using and building on Taylor's tools and protocols to further chart the wild west that is ant neurobiology. Following her foundational PhD, Taylor has stayed in the lab as a postdoc while she's finishing up a few experiments and planning the next steps of her scientific career, which I, which I am sure will be an illustrious one. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Taylor Hart.
so. Tom Heinmarsten hails from Sweden, but arrived at Rockefeller Un University via NYU with a dual degree in neuroscience and chemistry, an impressive foundation in computational studies of neural circuitry, and a deep interest to understand the fundamental flexibility of animal behavior. How our responses to the world around us are not fixed, but constantly in flux, shaped at every moment by our changing needs and motivations, our whims and desires. So nowhere is this sort of behavioral flexibility more apparent than in the context of social interactions, where the rapidly unfolding feedback loops between individuals requires animals to continually fine tune their behavior, to define with whom to interact and how. In joining my lab, Tom immediately honed in on the rich uh, social dynamics of Drosophila, the fruit fly, to define how internal drives and desires are instantiated in the brain and can fundamentally alter the link between perception and, and action. Because you see, the social life of a fruit fly is surprisingly complex. A male fly landing on a fermenting fruit in search of a mate faces a daunting task. He must be able to identify a desirable female from the crowd, persistently chase her and serenade her with a love song generated by fluttering his wings, all to entice her to copulate, all at the same time aggressively fending off rival males who are vying for the same female. Tom recognized that a mechanistic understanding of how males flexibly navigate such a complex social landscape would ultimately require access to the underlying neural dynamics of the male brain. And despite actually having no prior experience as an experimentalist, Tom developed an innovative virtual reality system to record neural activity as a male fly interacted um, with a fictive fly under the microscope, revealing how the same visual target can alternatively be perceived as a female to court or a competitor to fight on a moment-to-moment -moment time scale, depending on the male's arousal state and centric context, shedding light on the remarkable flexibility of social brain circuits. Tom's beautiful studies offer insight into a core feature of ner all nervous systems, revealing with unprecedented clarity how instinctive drives prioritize and shape the flow of information through the brain with own important implications for our own capacity for adaptive behavior. So Tom has proven that he has many strengths as a scientist. He really, truly is a rare force. But I, what I admire most is the pure joy that he brings to the discovery process, taking a simple behavioral observation like the fluttering of a male's wings and immediately intuiting what it may hint about the ba brain's basic computations, which he then proceeded to unravel with ferocious and brilliant intensity. It has been an absolute privilege to watch Tom's discoveries unfold over the years and a joy to work with him as a colleague and a friend. So Tom has left us for the West Coast, where he's now a postdoc at Stanford with Leech and Lowe, and there is no doubt that he will continue to unravel new insights into the basic structure of behavior. We miss him dearly already. So Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Tom Heinmarsten. When Kevin Cow joined the lab for his thesis research, it was clear to me that his technical skills were only surpassed by his far-ranging interests in biology. There were days when he would be working on three projects simultaneously and planning on starting in on a fourth. Of course, my instinct was to try to rein him in, but I quickly discovered that the true role of a thesis advisor is to do no harm. And of course, he wouldn't have listened even if I did. The postdocs sought him out for his advice, the technicians relied on him for his expertise, and I look forward to hearing what new ideas were percolating. Kevin grew up in Los Angeles and moved to the Bay Area for college where he received his BA in neurobiology from UC Berkeley, studying the neural circuits that govern sleep-wake cycles, an experience that solidified his desire to pursue a career in research. After graduation, he spent two years as a research assistant in the lab of Irv Weissman at Stanford University, where he worked on defining transcription factors that regulate hematopoietic stem cell function, as well as studying the famous don't eat me signals and their role as targets in cancer immuno immunotherapy. These far-ranging interests set the background for his impressive work he completed during his tenure in the lab, spanning immunology, virology, structural biology, and biochemistry. One of Kevin's thesis projects resulted in a fundamental discovery that alters our understanding of how T-cell activation 
occurs during viral infection. He identified a novel co-stimulatory pathway induced by multiple viruses late in infection, triggered by the immune complexes that are generated by antibody recognition of viral antigens. His studies have overturned decades of dogma and dozens of review articles I had authored regarding the interaction of immune complexes with T cells and helps explain the mechanisms by which exhausted T cells can be rescued as well as how viral infection can trigger immunopathology. The implications are profound. His work highlights not only the plasticity of the immune response in infection, but provides a coherent explanation for the immunopathology that can arise in infections. In other words, he provided an elegant solution to the interactions of antibodies with T cells in infection, explaining how protection and pathogenicity are thus inherently linked. Our challenge is to build on his observations and identify the factors that favor the first over the second. And as I mentioned earlier this morning, his work with Aaron Gupta on identification and characterization of the FC glycan specific nanobodies was remarkable in every respect. Kevin is an extraordinary student who displayed superb technical skills, intellectual rigor, and the creativity I've only encountered a few times in my 40 years working with students and fellows. His knowledge, expertise, and passion for science have been a source of inspiration to others and a delight to me. Working with Kevin brought to mind a favorite quote of mine by the chemist and author Primo Levi from his collection, The Periodic Table. If you'll indulge me. The lab is a place for the young, and returning there you feel young again, with the same longing for adventure, discovery, and the unexpected that you have at 17. Of course, you haven't been 17 for some time now, and besides, your long career as a parachemist has mortified you, rendered you atrophied, handicapped, catch you ignorant as to where reagents and equipment are stored, forgetful of everything except the fundamental reactions. But precisely for these reasons, the lab revisited is a source of joy and exerts an intense fascination, which is that of youth, of an indeterminate future pregnant with possibilities, that is, of freedom. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Kevin Cow for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. In our lifetimes, two copies of our DNA are divided equally between daughter cells over 10,000 trillion times. During each cell division, an envelope that encloses and protects our DNA must disassemble and then reassemble around the partition DNA. Errors in this process, which must be completed with, within a few minutes, can result in DNA being left outside the nucleus and DNA fragmentation and, has, and can cause cancer and lead to aging. Megan Elizabeth Kelly employed state-of-the-art live cell microscopy methods and fast-acting chemical probes to examine nuclear envelope assembly dynamics in dividing human cells. She focused on spastin, an ATPase mechanoenzyme for which she helped develop a potent and selective drug-like drug chemical inhibitor. Using a series of really clever experiments, she uncovered how precisely spastin removes tiny remnants of the cell division apparatus that may interfere with the nuclear envelope assembly process. Her work has uncovered a fundamental mechanism that ensures the stable propagation of our genomes through cell division and suggests how spastin mutations that are identified in patients can lead to diseases. Megan is finalizing her publications and will soon be starting her postdoctoral research. During her time with us, Megan inspired us with her intellect, creativity, and tenacity. We will miss her excitement for cutting-edge microscopy, tiny holes in the nucleus, and her impressive knowledge of New York City, including locations where Martin Scorsese may be found filming some terrifying scenes. <laughs> we wish her the very best and look forward to her continued success. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my privilege to present to you Megan Elizabeth Kelly.
On March 31st, Sam Kudersky successfully defended his thesis. As he eagerly awaited the day's end, I found myself filled with gratitude, reflecting on how much Sam had grown and what he had taught us over the past six years. At the end of his defense, in a closed room, one committee member remarked, no one else is like Sam Kudersky. Sam has a unique presentation style, simple yet elegant. His acknowledgement was short and did not pour his emotions. He had a sharp mind and clearly and honestly answered the questions. To me, he uniquely fit into my career trajectory as a first rotation student in my lab. Sam grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota and obtained his bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Oxford in the UK. Since he was the first rotation student in my lab, I asked Sam to present a research paper every week in our three-person lab meeting. Sam did not complain, at least not very loudly. <laughs> Later, I found that having a great scholarship is one of Sam's biggest strengths that stand out from many of his peers. Sam's thesis project was to study the evolution and the regulatory basis of sex-biased gene expression. He discovered different expression and selective patterns between males and females in the insect brain. He studied the variations, but not the mean expression changes in humans, and used an evolutionary perspective to study the meanings of the, these changes in sex-biased disease. Additionally, he developed a deep learning approach to study the basis of open chromatin conformation and the regulation. Sam genuinely cares about the scientific environment in the lab. During the pandemic lockdown, he and another student, Eric, they read through a population genomic book with the lab. That helped my lab become more comfortable with population genetics. Sam wanted to do science that is relevant to humanity, which is partly why he expanded his thesis project to humans. As the next step, he will pursue an MD at the University of Pennsylvania and to be a physician scientist. It has been my privilege to witness Sam, Sam grow as a scientist, see his, his ups and downs, and watch him explore a slightly different trajectory and career trajectory. I have no doubt that Sam will be excellent in medical school and hope that he will remember our university's motto and do great things for the benefit of humanity. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Sam Kudersky. Charles Gunnar Kinzig. As an undergraduate at Yale, Charlie worked in George Stites' lab, of course on RNA, what else, which may explain why Charlie, at the first Halloween in my lab, showed up dressed as a messenger RNA, <laughs> complete with an AUG start codon on his chest, a five prime cap on his head, and a pulley A tail at his other end. <laughs> Will he show up dressed as a telomere at Halloween in his future postdoc lab, <laughs> bearing an armor made of sheltrin and perhaps a T loop tail? I doubt it. <laughs> For the PhD part of his MD PhD training, Charlie decided in early 2019 to ask whether telomerase can add telomeres to broken chromosome ends. The logic of the telomere system is that telomerase only adds telomeric repeats to telomeres so that sheltering can continue binding there and prevent the natural ends from, of chromosomes be, from being recognized as broken DNA. 
If telomerase would add telomeres to broken ends in our genome, we argued, the distal part of a chromosome arm could be lost with potentially tumorigenic consequences. Charlie showed that telomerase, in fact, can make new telomeres at broken DNA ends. But he also showed that in our cells, normally, this reaction is averted, this threat is dampened by employing the ATR kinase, a kinase that's activated at DNA breaks and keeps telomerase at bay. This project was disconnected from all the other work in my lab. So Charlie had to build every method, every cell line, every plasmid, every assay from scratch. And although I often feared that I had set him up for failure, he took the project from inception to submission, something that rarely happens in the short research period afforded our MD-PhD trainees. And this is even more remarkable because, of course, uh, the COVID pandemic hit, which in Charlie's case was in his second year. During the dark and lonely days of the lockdown, Charlie asked how children evolved in animals, a question he could simply ask by using his computer at home, and which resulted in an interesting answer that is now published. Once back at the bench, Charlie completed his project with frantic activity, allowing him to defend in fall 2022, return to the clinic, and submit his paper. The story is not quite done, because in their exuberant enthusiasm, the reviewers came up with scores of experiments, which are now the burden of others in the lab, while Charlie is becoming a card-carrying MD. President Lifton, Chairman Ford, honored guests, it's my pleasure, pleasure to present to you Charlie Ginsburg. Elena Kotliar grew up in Brooklyn and attended neighborhood public schools. In high school, she participated in a pilot program that introduced her to advanced organic chemistry. Just a few years later, she graduated summa cum laude from Cornell with a degree in chemistry. For her thesis research, Elana studied cell surface proteins called G-protein coupled receptors, or GPCRs. There are over 750 different GPCRs in humans, and many of them are targets for therapeutic drugs. One of the challenges about searching for new drugs is that some GPCRs only function properly when they form a complex in cell membranes with other proteins called ramps. Elena perfected a multiplexed assay that employed color-coded magnetic microbeads to pull out GPCR ramp complexes from complex mixtures of cell proteins. Using this so-called suspension bead array assay, Ilana discovered almost 50 new GPCR ramp complexes with biological significance. In ongoing work, Ilana also created a unique library of GPCRs that will be used in her multiplexed bead assay to search for auto-anti-GPCR antibodies in blood samples from patients with autoimmune diseases, such as lupus, preeclampsia of pregnancy, and long COVID. Elana has taken on many responsibilities in our Tri-I campus community. For example, she spearheaded the establishment of a global mentoring initiative that connects existing graduate students with undergraduates anywhere in the world who are thinking about applying to graduate school in the life sciences. Ilana is a uniquely bright and enthusiastic person. 
and a talented and creative scientist. Ilana will move from the lab bench to a position in a major biotechnology management consulting firm here in New York. President Lifton, Chairman Ford, and honored guests, it is my privilege to present to you Ilana Kotliar. It is my pleasure to introduce Brandon Malone on behalf of Sestars and Elizabeth Campbell, who cannot be here today due to family commitments. So now the following remarks from uh, Liz and Seth. Brandon excelled in high school and college in his native Ireland, where he graduated with a 4.0 GPA from University College Cork. Soon afterwards, Brandon joined the Rockefeller graduate program and joined the Stars Campbell lab, lab in the fall of 2019, not that too long ago. Initially, Brandon's work involved structural studies to investigate how the bacteria RNA polymerase binds and melts DNA in a process called transcription, in which all of the cell's RNA is synthesized, sort of the lab's day job. He contributed results that earned co-authorship in one manuscript that has been published, as well as two additional ones that are still in preparation. As we're all painfully familiar, soon after that, in March of 2020, all research at the Rockefeller University was shut down, except research related to SARS-CoV-2. Liz Campbell, James Chen, a senior graduate student in the lab, along with Brandon, realized they could apply their expertise studying bacterial transcription complexes to study SARS-CoV-2 RNA synthesis. In only a few months, it literally started from scratch, Brandon, James, Eliza Llewellyn, a research assistant in the lab, and Liz forged major contributions to this field and started what is now a thriving research program in the laboratory. Brandon's thesis was titled Structures, Functions, and Drugability of the SARS-CoV-2 Replication Transcription Complex, but it could easily have been how I kept myself busy during the pandemic. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Brandon Malone. Today we know that the generation of even some of the simplest behaviors require highly coordinated and interregional communication of vast number of neurons in the brain. How to capture the activity of such large scale and distributed neuronal population, however, has been a key technological challenge in the field and a major focus of our lab. However, developing such tools is still relatively easy compared to making sense of out of the enormous data generated by them. But not for Jason who joined the lab with the ambitious goal of identifying the neural basis of behavior variability, designing and building first a dedicated microscope for whole brain recording in larva zebrafish engaged in visual decision-making tasks, Jason found that he could perfectly decode the animal's visual inputs from their underlying neural activity. In fact, he discovered that they, may, they, they were mathematically encoded in a space orthogonal to that encoding for motor responses. This means that the animal's behavior variability was not due to noisy or unfaithful representation of the visual inputs, but was rather generated through the, through the interaction of presumably neurons encoding for the changes of internal states uh, with those underlying animal's motor responses. Consistent with this idea, Jason showed that he could also predict the behavior of the animal on a trial-by-trial -trial level using the premotor neuronal population. But Jason just didn't stop here. In a completely different project, he wanted to know 
uh, what, he can, what can he learn about the high dimensional geometry of the neuronal population dynamics by taking advantage of recordings from one million neurons across the entire brain of the mouse at the cellular resolution, which was just enabled a few months ago by a new microscopy tool built in the lab. Taking advantage of this unique data set, he discovered that somewhat in contrast to what is commonly assumed, that the amount of the reliable information, uh, even at the scale of one million neuron, kept increasing as one recorded from even more neurons. But importantly, Jage found that while half of the information in the data was related to the immediate moment-by-moment -moment, uh, behavior of the animal, the other half was not, didn't have any behavior or, or sensory-related correlates, and as we speculate now, might represent the neural substrate of brain functions such as thoughts or other internal neural computations. Those of you who know Jason or have seen his talk know that he is an exceptional scientist. He's creative, extremely rigorous, an exemplary communicator, and modest. I saw outside of the lab, Jason is a classic music lover, pianist, and singer, always with a smile on his face and a positive attitude and eager to help others. Jason has been a wonderful lab citizen. He will be dearly missed as he and his wife, Amy, will be moving to Atlanta. But I hope we will be able still to bring him back from time to time to New York. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Jason Manley. Jordan Mathiason grew up in Renton, Washington, just south of, she of Seattle. She received a BS degree with honors in chemistry from Simmons College in Boston, where she focused initially on synthesis of so-called photoresist polymers for semiconductor applications. For her thesis research, Jordan advanced a drug discovery methodolo methodology called fragment-based drug screening. In FBDS, Fragments of potential drugs are added to protein drug targets in mixtures with other fragments to find the correct key and lock combination to have the desired effect. The problem with FBDS is that it doesn't usually work very well. The fragments just don't bind well enough to study in cells. Jordan reasoned that she could use bioorthogonal chemistry to tether one of the drug fragments to the drug target, while then testing the rest of the fragment library in a cell-based assay. This was an extremely ambitious project. So ambitious, in fact, that we had to convince one of the largest pharma companies on the planet, Pfizer, to help us. And after seeing Jordan's preliminary data, they did. Soon, Jordan was coaching an all-star chemistry team at Pfizer and the results have been spectacular and are really opening up an exciting new drug discovery strategy. When she is not in the lab, Jordan is a competitive open water swimmer, a practice she started when the asphalt green swimming pool was closed during the pandemic. In July 2022, Jordan completed the 20 Bridges Swim, which is a 28.5 mile swim around Manhattan Island. I would dare say that none of us here today, except for Jordan, has waved to our lab mates from the East River. <laughs> Jordan is really a fantastic laboratory colleague, a creative and persevering scientist, and a kind and generous person. She will move to the Boston area for a postdoctoral fellowship. President Lifton, Chairman Ford, and honored guests, it is my privilege to present to you Jordan Mathiason.
it, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce Peter Muscles Perez to you today. In my lab, we study how brains allow us to navigate space using the Drosophila fruit fly model. And before Peter arrived, we had found that if you make flies hot, they try to escape this circumstance by running along a randomly chosen direction, presumably hoping to find shade, which they never find. <laughs> in parallel to these behavioral findings, it had also become evident that flies have a set of neurons in their brain that function like a compass. Bees and ants clearly need a neural compass to find their way back to the nest, but why would flies need such a thing? In his first year in my lab, in collaboration with Jonathan Green and Vikram Vijayan, Peter silenced the activity of compass neurons and showed that flies could no longer keep a stable random direction in the task I just mentioned. Peter thus nailed down the first clear function for compass neurons in the fly brain. Now, this initial project made clear that the compass neurons signal the direction in which the flies are currently walking. But what remained unclear was how the fly brain signaled the direction in which the flies wanted to be walking. That is the fly's goal angle. So for his PhD, P Peter committed himself to discovering the nature of a navigational goal angle. And he ultimately discovered a set of neurons called FC2 cells that signal the fly's navigational goal. This was a remarkable finding that allow us to see for the first time what a fly wanted to be doing in the future. Moreover, Peter characterized how the fly goal signal is used by the motor system to guide behavior, and he characterized the first neural circuit of its kind to explain how this transformation happens. Overall, Peter has been a dream student to work with. He's like uh, this immutable rock of stability and perseverance when everything is going wrong in the lab, he's stable. Even through periods of scientific confusion and hardship, he never wavered, focusing clearly on his goal just like his flies. And he always found a way to move things forward. And despite being typically the smartest person in any room, he's remarkably humble and kind. And he isn't the type to demand the attention be on him ever. But the discoveries he made are the opposite of humble. They're loud and showy and definitive. And all the attention that his work has received and hopefully will continue to receive could not be more well-deserved. Peter. It has been a privilege to witness you make your beautiful insights. Congratulations on these achievements and all that awaits you in the future. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Peter Muscles Pyrrhus. Huang Wen was exceptionally well-traveled as a child when his parents took on a series of academic positions in Asia, Europe, and the United States. Perhaps it is from these experiences that he became adventurous, adaptable, and creative, qualities that served her, him very well as he came of age. After re receiving his bachelor's degree at the University of Georgia, Tuan was accepted into the tri uh, MD PhD program in 2015. Born out of his long-standing interest in the dynamic behavior of biomolecules, he chose my laboratory as a home for his PhD thesis research. Transcription factors, long known to control gene expression through the recognition of specific DNA motifs, have recently been suggested to regulate and organize transcription through the formation of molecular condensates. Tuan's work added a new layer of complexity to this paradigm. Leveraging cutting-edge single molecule biophysical tools to directly visualize the condensation process in real time, Tuan found that some transcription factors, such as the pluripotent factor SOX2, can pull genomic DNA into these microscopic droplets, and in doing so, generate remarkable amounts of force on the DNA to a level that can potentially damage DNA and inhibit genomic machines. Remarkably, Tuan further showed that the nucleosomes present in our genome drastically reduce such mechanical stress by sequestering SOX2 in their vicinity. As such, besides their well-known role as genome organization units 
Nucleosomes also serve as mechanical sinks to protect genome stability. The discovery of this fascinating tug of war between different uh, genomic reg regions mediated by transcription factors is only made possible by Twan's elegant experiments and rigorous analysis, which allowed him to see the unseen and feel the unfelt. I look forward to seeing Tuan now back to the clinic, use his quantitative mind and inquisitive eyes to treat individual patients with the same level of care and thoroughness as he did for the single molecules in the past five years. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Tuan Nguyen. Agata Lemiesz Patriotis came to Rockefeller originally from Poland, where she was a star student at the University of Łódź. She was inspired by the great Polish scientist Marie Curie, who was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize, the first person to win the Nobel Prize twice, and the only person to win in two different scientific disciplines. Curie said, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. In the lab of our sadly departed colleague, David Alice, a giant in the study of chromatin and its variations, Agata took that to heart and completed a beautiful thesis on the molecular mechanisms of epigenetic regulation in development and disease. This included work on the PRC2 protein, the key mediator of epigenetic regulation, and an analysis of the landscape of histone mutations in human cancer. Now, a PhD is difficult to accomplish under the best of circumstances, and it is particularly challenging when you lose your advisor towards the end of your PhD, your advisor and mentor. It is a testament to Agata's uh, perseverance and, uh, and dedication that she was able to complete her thesis uh, as successfully as she has. It has been my pleasure to get to know her both as an outstanding scientist uh, also as a caring uh, mother, and now as a postdoctoral fellow heading to the lab of Tyler Jacks at MIT, where I'm sure she will be fabulously successful, and I look forward to following her achievements. Mr. President, Mr. Chair, esteemed guests, it is my honor to present Agata Lemiesz Petriotis. Harlan Linver Peets studies the multi drug resistant proteins MRP1 and MRP2. These transporters hinder drug delivery across the blood brain barrier, and in some cancers, their overexpression leads to acquired multi drug resistance, which is a major hurdle in chemotherapy. Over the past four and a half years, Harlan has made many important discoveries that have helped us better understand how those transporters work and how to regulate their activities. For example, in collaboration with Hiro Suga's lab in the University of Tokyo, Holland discovered a cyclic peptide that selectively <coughs> inhibits MRP1 with high potency. Using cryo microscopy, he showed that this peptide outcompetes normal substrates and traps the transporter in an inactive conformation. 
this work demonstrated the potential of using cyclic peptides as therapeutics to enhance drug delivery across biological barriers and improve the efficacy of chemotherapy. In addition to being a passionate scientist, as an MD PhD student, Holland has also demonstrated the principles of compassionate care and service. Throughout his PhD training, he regularly volunteered to provide medical service to underserved patients. During the challenging times of the pandemic, he stepped up to help with testing and vaccination. In the lab, Holland is a warm and a generous colleague. To patients, he is an uplifting and a caring doctor. He's also an endurance athlete. His ability to handle many tasks and stay strong shows his outstanding character and the determination to succeed. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Harlan Lever Pete. To complete a PhD thesis in virology during a global virus pandemic is to experience a unique challenge, but that's exactly what faced Daniel Poston. Daniel joined my lab as a tri-AMD PhD student in 2018 and was making excellent progress studying the intricacies of HIV particle assembly and hunting for human genes that defend against retroviruses. But early in 2020, everything changed. New York City became the epicenter of a global pandemic, and Daniel was among those who put their lives and projects on hold to study and tackle this new threat to human health. Daniel did a number of important things during the pandemic. As part of a team studying SARS-CoV-2 resistance to antibodies, he built computational pipelines to analyze spike protein variants. Additionally, he almost single-handedly addressed the rather hopeful idea that antibodies elicited by a variety of common cold coronaviruses might protect against SARS-CoV-2. He showed clearly that they did not. As, as if that was not enough, Daniel also completed a screen for human genes required for coronavirus replication. In so doing, he showed that a protein complex called Retroma was crucial for infection, not only by coronaviruses, but also by the Ebola virus. Daniel showed how Retroma controls the activity of endosomal proteases called cathepsins that some viruses use to infect cells. As the worst of the pandemic subsided, subsided uh, Daniel returned to his pre-pandemic work on HIV-1. He completed his studies that showed how a small molecule metabolite made by our cells controls the stability of a structural protein lattice that drives HIV-1 particle assembly. He also completed screens for host genes that defend against HIV-1 infections, whose mechanisms we continue to investigate. Despite the uniquely challenging circumstances, Daniel's sharp intellect, unwavering commitment, professionalism, strength of character, selflessness, cheerfulness, leadership, can-do attitude, I could go on, and fortitude in the face of adversity shone through in dark times. These qualities had ultimately enabled him to achieve a great deal during his thesis studies. We miss Daniel as he's gone back to medical school, but take solace in the knowledge that he's destined for a great future success as a physician scientist. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, honored guest, it's my pleasure and honor to present to you Daniel Poston.
So it's my pleasure to present Nick Poulton for his doctoral degree from the Rockefeller University. Nick grew up in Westchester, uh, New York, and came to Rockefeller as a PhD student after completing an undergraduate degree at the University of Rochester. Nick chose a thesis project with the goal of developing a better understanding of the mechanisms of drug resistance in the pathogen mycobacterium tuberculosis, which I mentioned earlier is responsible for causing TB. His research is not only intriguing from a biological perspective, but it's also crucial to help develop improved treatments for this disease. Nick worked closely with an excellent postdoc in the lab, Xu Chi Li, to turn our lab's CRISPR interference approach into a chemical genetics platform that could discover drug mechanism of action and identify new mechanisms of drug resistance. Here, Nick could systematically silence every bacterial gene in the presence or absence of drug treatment to see how gene silencing influenced bacterial drug susceptibility. This work has been tremendously fun and has been a gold mine of both interesting biology, but also a practical application to help guide the development of preclinical uh, TB drug candidates with the Gates Foundation. In a series of three papers, Nick went on to discover, amongst other things, uh, a previously unknown ribosome protection mechanism, which he named okra, uh, mutations in the transporter back a that drive aminoglycoside resistance, and he identified a new mechanism of ribosome stress that causes drug resistance in TB. Uh, in this odd but apparently effective mechanism, partial loss of function mutations in the essential translation factor at A cause translation stress, constrictively activates the YB7 stress response, which then drives low-level multidrug acquired uh, resistance. This new mode of drug resistance is particularly associated with a multidrug resistant TB outbreak ongoing in South America. But it wasn't all bad news for humans. Uh, Nick also found that the same YB7 stress response was inactivated in an entire MTB sub sublineage endemic to Southeast Asia, presenting an opportunity to potentially repurpose macrolide antibiotics to treat TB in this part of the world. Uh, this is a finding we are very much hoping that clinicians will find useful. Nick will perform his postdoctoral work with Patrick Duffy at the NIH, where he will return to his immunology roots to develop to study and develop uh, new malaria vaccines. Nick's sound advice, golden hands at the bench, and bad dad jokes and puns will be sorely missed. Uh, but we are excited for him for his next adventure in malaria and know that he will excel. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my great pleasure to present to you Nick Poulton. Christina Pretzel followed quite an unusual path to our doctoral program. Having already completed an MD and a residency specializing in radiology in Vienna, Christina began here as an instructor in clinical investigation using imaging to study temporal lobe epilepsy and, and facial recognition with Winrich Freiwald. During discussions between our labs on how to use insights from brain imaging to to study human disease, Christina decided that she needed a Rockefeller-style doctoral experience to understand the power and beauty of both imaging and molecular biology. It became clear to me very soon after Christina joined uh, that Christina had the talent and attention to detail to achieve her goals, and she joins our lab in an effort to understand the molecular, molecular pathophysiology of human disease. Huntington's disease is a devastating and fatal malady whose most recognizable features are the motor irregularities, the so-called chorea, that accompany the disease. Although our studies to delineate the causes of these motor systems were well underway, the basis for the prominent psychiatric systems that are also present in Huntington's disease was unknown. Christina accepted the challenge of deciphering this aspect of Huntington's disease and she has made two fundamentally important contributions to the field. First, she discovered the single cell type that dies in the cerebral cortex, 
of Huntington's disease patients early in the disease, and she showed that these cells project to a structure called the, the striatum. This was an interesting twist of, feet, of fate, as it explained the disconnection between the cortex and the striatum that had been previously noted by neural imaging studies in human patients. Second, Christina showed that one of the cardinal features of the disorder, somatic expansion of the disease-causing gene, occurs both in this vulnerable cell type that dies early in the disease and in their more resilient neighbors in the cerebral cortex. Both of these discoveries were totally unexpected. They came as complete surprises to the field. Christina's findings and the comprehensive data sets she provided based on technology that she developed have energized the field and led to new ideas regarding hunting disease pathophysiology and perhaps treatment. It's been a tremendous pleasure to have Christina in the lab. She's very intelligent and precise and she's become a value con colleague to me and to everyone else in the lab. I'm delighted that she's, uh, Christina is both a leader and a team player. This is absolutely essential in a research effort like this that requires all hands on board. I'm delighted that she has decided to continue to leave our, our efforts to understand the cerebral cor cortex pathology in Huntington's disease and to extend that to Alzheimer's disease, perhaps one of the most important challenges facing humanity. How very brave of her. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guest, it's my pleasure to present to you Christina Pretzel. David Requeta. In Peru, where his talents were prized, David Requeta had thrived. In bioinformatics, he excelled, teaching and mentoring he'd meld. For his students, he was idolized. Now at Rockefeller, David still strives to stop what cancer deprives. With bioinformatics, he analyzes the antics of fiber lamellar that takes many lives. Using tools of computation, he'll trace the secrets hidden within that space. Methylomics, genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics are used and cancers embrace. He searched deeply in data for clues for what this cancer pursues. Its drivers and frailties can reveal new therapies to evade this tumor's ruse. In collaboration, he worked with his lab mates, testing data that generated debates. Models contested, hypotheses tested, it's impressive what David creates. David's devised our tools and more that we use to query and implore. Metastases and primaries are all in our libraries, showing us what to explore. As a father of two, he is proud. His son, Bash, he codes in the cloud. He's three with a knack to surpass any hack. His brilliance is clearly endowed. His daughter, Luciana, is so bright. In high school by day and our lab by night, in the fall, should we dwell in at Carnegie Mellon using AI to generate insight? He's done quite a lot, I'm sure you'll agree. So now it's time to get his degree. Mr. Chairman, to the president and guests, Mr. Chairman, my requests to David and his PhD.
Chris Roya hails from Canada and attended McGill University prior to starting his thesis work in my lab. Our cells contain compartments called mitochondria within which energy-rich molecules are produced that fuel cellular activity. Mitochondria contain their own DNA, which produces RNA that encodes for mitochondrial proteins. Mitochondria also have their own transfer RNAs, or tRNAs, which are adapter molecules that recognize the triplet code in mitochondrial RNA, which allows their bound amino acids to be incorporated into mitochondrial proteins. The activity of mitochondria in each of our cells needs to be coordinated with the activity of the nucleus, which is the master control center within our cells. The mechanisms by which mitochondria and the nucleus communicate and coordinate their activities and needs is an active area of investigation. Chris made the surprising discovery that three specific mitochondrial transfer RNAs travel from mitochondria to the nucleus. To understand the consequences of this transfer, he focused on one such nuclear transferred mitochondrial tRNA. He found that the presence of this mitochondrial tRNA in the nucleus leads to removal of a protein called the histone deacetylase from certain regions of the DNA in the nucleus. As we know from the pioneer work of David Alice, histone deacetylases remove acetyl marks from histones, and this associates with altered activity of genes. Indeed, Chris found that this mitochondrial tRNA impacts the activity of a gene in the nucleus that is involved in mitochondrial metabolism. Chris's work reveals that genetic material in the form of RNA can travel from one compartment of the cell to another, where it can regulate nuclear gene activity, allowing for coordination between key compartments of the cell. There is no challenge big enough for Chris. He is fearless, creative, and rigorous scientist and an exemplary communicator. Chris will now pursue medical training so that he can focus on the molecular basis of disease when he starts his own future lab. Chris, I wish you the best on your future biomedical training, and I can't wait to see you continue to make exciting discoveries. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Chris Roya. By all accounts, Chris Safran is an unusual student, coming to us with rich life experiences, including being an undercover detective for NYPD, busting drug dealers in Manhattan, and being a first responder after 9-11. After quitting NYPD and raising his daughter, he went back to school and obtained bachelor's degree in biophysics and graduating cum laude from Columbia University. He worked in the laboratory of Dr. Michael Caplet at Weill Cornell for two years and then joined our TRI-I MD-PhD program, eventually finding his way to my laboratory. In our lab, Chris has studied a nuclease called FAN1, which has a complex life in multiple DNA repair pathways. One of its roles is in the repair of DNA interstand crosslinks, for example, those that are formed by cisplatin, a commonly used chemotherapeutic agent. Using cellular and mouse models, Chris discovered that FAN1 works synergistically with another nuclease, SNM1A, to pro protect kidney and liver, but not the blood stem cells from DNA damaging agents. A second role of FAN1 is in the repair of DNA secondary structures that are formed when trinucleotide repeats, for example, CAG repeats, are misaligned and form abnormal DNA loops. Huntington's disease is a devastating neurological syndrome that is caused by the expansion of such CAG repeats. Through alpha-fold modeling and biochemistry, Chris came up with an exciting model of how FAN1 levels can modulate the expansion and contraction of the CAG repeats. 
Chris has always been driven by clinically relevant research, his interest in aging, and his desire to help patients. While in the lab, he also continued his clinical work at the Wright Center on Aging and in the Emergency Department. His caring nature has also been on display while being a fabulous mentor of our Gateway to Laboratory student who is now in medical school. Chris will soon wrap up his studies in the lab and will be going back to finish medical school, hopefully finding new clinically relevant questions to pursue in the future. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honor guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Chris Safran. So 10 years ago, I received an email from Andrew Siliciano, a self-professed recovering physicist with a master's degree in engineering and applied physics from Cornell University and a desire to gain experience in a neuroscience lab before applying to medical school. From our first discussion, Andy's clarity of thought, deep curiosity for science, and quiet ambition were obvious. I was thrilled when he joined the lab as a research assistant, and even more elated when he returned to the lab several years later as an MD-PhD student to carry out his thesis work ultimately leaving an indelible imprint on our group in the field. So for most animals' olfaction, the sense of smell is the central sensory modality that they use to navigate their environment. As odors are liberated from the source into the air, they act as chemical beacons, an olfactory north star that animals can use to navigate over long distances. While this ability to track an olfactory plume wafting through the air is thought to be one of the most evolutionary ancient and elementary forms of navigation, the underlying neural and behavioral algorithms have long remained elusive due to the fact that simply odors are invisible and often turbulent in influx, making it challenging to define the essential link between sensation and action that has been established for other sensory systems. Andy overcame this fundamental challenge in the most spectacular way, leveraging his inner in engineer to build a clever virtual reality system in which head-fixed Drosophila fruit flies could navigate within a fictive chemical landscape, enabling him to shed light onto the core algorithms of this behavior and connect each turn of his flies that weaved in and out of the odor plume with the underlying neural dynamics. Andy's work revealed that plume navigation is unexpectedly not just a simple reflex as previously thought, but represents a far more sophisticated form of spatial memory akin to the kind of cognitive maps described for mammals that provide you and me with a sense of space and direction. So I should say it's very, uh, really a rare privilege to watch a trainee like Andy blossom over the course of 10 years, but I think it offers some unique perspective. So like the best of scientists, Andy is intellectually adventurous nim and nimble, unfazed to move into completely novel territory opening up new scientific vistas along the way. He follows science where it leads them, motivated really only by his pure curiosity and passion for science. But importantly, he does so with incredible generosity, humility, and kindness. I feel so fortunate to have had such a long and wonderful period of time working together and to have him emerge as really a colleague and a friend. So Andy is now back in medical school, school, embarking on a career as a physician scientist that I have no doubt he will continue to navigate with incredible success. So Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it's my great pleasure and honor to introduce, present Andy Siciliano. Andrew Toder. <clears throat> Andrew is Romanian, grew up in Michigan, graduated magna cum laude from Duke University in biomedical and electrical engineering, 
and then joined us here at the Tri-Institutional MD-PhD program. When I first met Andrew, I had many reasons to recruit him to join my lab. One, he'd been a competitive swimmer most of his life, as had I, and I knew there is no better preparation for a PhD than competitive swimming. Ye years of self-inflicted trauma. <laughs> Two, he was, a, he was also a medical student, as I had been, slightly prone to perfectionism, but with a unique perspective on the brain and the human condition. And three, he wanted to tackle the big problems. We talked for hours about topics that interested him. What is a memory? Why are some memories stronger than others? And to what extent can brain stimulation or neuroprosthetics improve memory? So all this to say, Andrew was brilliant and driven. During the course of his PhD, he took on a problem that stumped the field for decades. How do short-term memories gradually reorganize across the brain into longer-term storage? To break open this problem, he worked hard to develop technologies and computational approaches that allowed, for the first time, to track brain activity from multiple brain regions in the behaving animal over weeks and months while memories are being formed, retrieved, forgotten, or consolidated over time. As he collected these gigantic data sets and poured through the analysis, I would often suggest models that could help explain his data. But the skeptic in him would refreshingly throw out my ideas in search of a better truth. When he chanced upon an interesting result, he'd spend months trying to disprove himself before finally being convinced of his own findings. Eventually, this work led him and his co-authors to an important discovery. The identification of a brain highway that links short and long-term memories. An important component of this highway is a region in the center of the brain called the thalamus, which not only helps select which memories should be remembered, but routes them to distant brain areas for long-term stabilization. He thus uncovered an unexpected and critical role for the thalamus in memory processing, which may be an attractive target for therapeutic intervention. So Andrew, it's, it's really been for me a deep privilege to do science with you these past many years. President Lifton, Chairman Ford, and honored guests, it's my pleasure to present to you Andrew Toder. It is a great pleasure to introduce Jazz Weissman to you today. Jazz arrived to Rockefeller after completing a bachelor's degree at chemistry, in chemistry at Reed College. But Jazz was far more than an ivory tower chemist when he arrived to Rockefeller. After high school and before starting at Reed, he spent four years renovating a warehouse into an art studio, makerspace constructing large-scale art pieces in that studio, working in music event production, and finally working in an electronic startup company before college. At Rockefeller, Jazz expected to do a PhD in chemistry, continuing off of his undergrad studies. But we couldn't be luckier that he ultimately chose to indulge his electronics and fabrication interests instead, joining my group where he could build transformative electromechanical gizmos for measuring fruit fly behavior. Using technology developed approximately 15 years ago, my lab and others routinely tether fruit flies in place and measure signals from their brains as they walk on tiny treadmills inside visual virtual reality environments. This sort of experiment has allowed us to develop the first detailed picture of how brains build an internal sense of space. But before Jazz, these experiments would last at most an hour or two. And in his PhD work, Jazz made it possible to keep tethered flies alive inside a virtual reality environment for three weeks or longer. The flies eat, sleep, poop, groom, and walk for weeks inside this virtual world. Um, and Jazz's technology should allow us to train flies on complex tasks over thousands of trials for the first time, like is possible in rodent systems, but been very hard in flies. The technology has already allowed Jazz to observe a new and important navigational behavior, namely, flies in this virtual world pick a specific direction along which to run and keep to that direction for three weeks, traveling hundreds of meters during this trek. 
Understanding how brains can store a consistent navigational goal over weeks should ultimately illuminate new biology about how brains form and retain long-term memories. And if you put together all the flies' trajectories that Jazz collected, they walked all the way across Manhattan, kind of like the student who swam all around Manhattan. <laughs> I will end by mentioning that Jazz is not only a gifted scientist, but he's also a beautiful and giving human being. Beyond his own PhD project, what I think highlights Jazz is that he's catalyzed so many other projects in my lab and beyond my lab that I cannot even begin to mention them all or thank him for all his efforts. Jazz is also a social hub here at Rockefeller who is beloved in my group and beyond for good reason. He's truly special. So Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present you Jazz Weissman. Hannes uh, Weimar grew up in, uh, near Leipzig in East Germany. Um, shortly after completing high school, Johannes spent a year in Israel as part of his compulsory uh, civilian service and was very taken by the culture which continues to be an important part of his life. Upon returning to Germany, he started medical school at the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena and was enamored by the more basic uh, courses so he took a year uh, to do a master's in immunology. He came to Rockefeller initially as a visiting student to spend a year working on HIV, but he fell in love with the science and decided to apply to and join the PhD program to get more in-depth scientific training. In the lab, Johannes focused on the problem of HIV latency, or why people that contract the disease are unable to rid themselves of the virus and must remain on suppressive medications for their entire lives. The root of this problem is that the virus integrates itself into the genome of rare immune cells and lives there as a silent interloper that can be reactivated at any time. Little was known about these cells because they are one in a million and hard to distinguish from others. For his thesis, Johannes developed a way to isolate and characterize these cells. His work provides a window into the biology of latency and enables us to think about strategies uh, to eliminate these Trojan horses. Johannes loved living in New York City, taking advantage of its diverse culture, including Broadway musicals, the opera, dancing to Britney Spears like there's no tomorrow, <laughs> <laughs> going to the beach and eating ice cream with sprinkles. Johannes is now back in Germany at the famous Charité Hospital in Berlin, where he's completing his medical residency. President Lifton, Chairman Ford, honored guests, it's a pleasure to present Johannes Weimar for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy. <laughs> It is my pleasure to present Andrew Wong for his doctoral degree from the Rockefeller University. Andrew grew up in Canada and came to Rockefeller as a PhD student after completing an undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. Uh, Andrew was my very first uh, PhD student and uh, your decision to join my lab was one of the highlights of my five and a half years here. He chose a thesis project uh, like Nick with the aim of better understanding the mechanisms of drug resistance in MTV 
And again, this isn't uh, you know intellectual navel gazing. You know this work is really important as we need better therapies to treat this disease. Building on some early chemical genetic screens from Xu Chi Li and uh, Nick Poulton, Andrew became fascinated with an adenylate cyclase, uh, a protein that produces the second messenger cyclic AMP, and the role that this signaling system plays in making MTB intrinsically resistant to a diversity of antibiotics. Mycobacterium tuberculosis devotes a considerable amount of coding capacity to produce, sense, and degrade cyclic AMP. Uh, for reference, our model bacterium E. coli encodes one adenylate cyclase and MTB encodes 15. Despite this fact, our understanding of how cyclic AMP regulates MTB physiology remains limited. Through a series of elegant genetic experiments, Andrew went on to show that his adenylate cyclase uh, and the cyclic AMP it produces is critical to coordinate intrinsic multidrug resistance and fatty acid metabolism. His work highlights the potential utility of small molecule modulators of cyclic AMP signaling as anti-TB agents. Andrew went on to name this gene MAC-E for major adenylate cyclase enzyme in honor of the legendary fashion designer Bob Mackey, uh, whose work you most recently saw in iconic images of the late Tina Turner. Beyond his thesis on Mackey, Andrew was instrumental in starting our lab's work on the emerging mycobacterial pathogen Mycobacterium abscessus. Andrew recently accepted a scientist position at the startup company Microbial Machines, where he will use synthetic biology approaches to engineer bacteria for therapeutic purposes. Andrew's wit, creativity, and community building left an indelible mark on our lab. We will miss him dearly, but know that he has a bright future ahead of him in Boston. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, it is my pleasure to present to you Andrew Warren. As scientists at Rockefeller University, we have the privilege to interact with brilliant minds in our daily life. Even among this group, if you have met Eric Zheng, you might quickly realize that he has many different qualities. Eric grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas. After excelling in school and swimming, he went to Harvard University for his undergraduate study. He graduated in 2015 and officially joined our lab in 2017. But this seemed to be a very typical path for scientists here. Why do I say Eric is different? First, what sets Eric apart is his intelligence and critical thinking skills. Whenever a lab member or I brought up an idea or some new data, Eric would not hesitate to use the most critical way to evaluate them. He's also not afraid to doubt his own data and experiment. This means I never had to worry about him exaggerating his discoveries. In the end, we all benefited tremendously from his comments and suggestions. Eric made our research program more rigorous and to some extent pushed us to be better scientists. Another excellent quality of Eric is he's always willing to help. When we started the lab, we didn't have a good system to store hundreds of terabytes of data sets. Eric helped me to create a robust system to ensure we have a good platform to keep the data integrity. He's also always willing to help others. For example, when my graduate student Sam wanted someone, to, someone else to read his code to ensure accuracy and reproducibility, Eric gladly helped. Their friendship and trust also led to a co-first author paper together on deep learning and uh, regulatory code. Eric himself also elegantly showed that there is substantial unappreciated diversity and evolutionary dynamics in new and small proteins. His method and results immediately became a classic for our field. He's currently doing his clerkship and continue his path as a physician scientist. I'm sure that with his intelligence and big heart, Eric will continue to uh, contribute to um, biomedical science and medicine. Mr. President, Mr. Chairman, and honored guests, 
It is my pleasure to present to you Eric Zheng. Now, by the authority of the Regents of the New England Commission of Higher Education, which they have invested in the trustees of the Rockefeller University, and is by them delegated to me, I confer upon you the degree Doctor of Philosophy, which admits you to all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining. Congratulations to this year's graduates. I'll just take a moment. You know, every year, the hooding of our graduates is one of the rate limiting steps in the entire process. If you have ever watched NASCAR or Formula One, you know that the pit stop is the most vital thing, and shaving seconds off the time is critical. Being quantitative scientists, we calculated last year that if we could cut 10 seconds off the hooding of every individual, we might shave five to six minutes from the entire two hour plus process. <laughs> well, this year's Hooders did an exceptional job and congratulations to Sebastian and Tita for your incredible contributions. So now it's my great pleasure to turn our attention to the 2023 recipients of the Doctor of Science Honoris Causa, Evelyn Lipper, Mark Kirshner, Kirshner and Ingrid Dobshi. These three individuals have shaped the scientific landscape in myriad ways through their vision, innovation, and leadership. It is a great privilege to recognize them today. I'd like to begin by recognizing one of Rockefeller's most beloved friends, Trustee Emerita Evelyn Groose Lipper. Evelyn's relationship to Rockefeller extends over four decades. Such depth of commitment uh, places her among the university's very most notable and passionate advocates, a small group that includes David Rockefeller. Evelyn shares other qualities with David Rockefeller. She is warm, insightful, and innately kind. Her involvement over the last 40 years has profoundly advanced our work and has touched all who have had the pleasure and privilege of knowing her. Evelyn became a member of the Rockefeller University Council in 1983 and was elected to the Board of Trustees in 1992. As a, a trustee, she has played an invaluable role on numerous board committees, including the Nominating, Development, Hospital, and Educational Affairs Committees. The years of Evelyn's tenure have been revolutionary for Rockefeller, and both the research programs and the campus landscape have been transformed. Evelyn's leadership has been instrumental in bringing about these advances. Evelyn's own career as a pediatrician specializing in child development has related closely to the work underway in the labs of our neuroscientists, and Evelyn has seized the opportunity to come to campus and talk shop with many of our faculty. Evelyn's interest in science dates back to her sophomore year of high school when she was drawn to the excitement of new discoveries in genetics. It was then that she decided upon a career in medicine. As you may know, medicine was not particularly welcoming to women at that time, but Evelyn was not deterred. After completing a Bachelor of Science at Simmons College, she earned her MD from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine of Yeshiva University, where one-fifth of Evelyn's graduating class was female. Very unusual at the time. 
Evelyn completed her residency in pediatrics at Babies Hospital for Columbia College of Physicians and Surgeons and Bronx Municipal Hospital and embarked upon a distinguished career as a pediatrician. With a specialty in development and behavioral pediatrics, Evelyn's thriving practice focused on maternal and infant psychotherapy. She joined the pediatrics faculty at her alma mater, Albert Einstein, and in 1977 uh, moved to Weill Cornell Medicine in 1982, where she remained for the next 32 years, during which she served as director of the Division of Developmental Pediatrics at both Weill Cornell Medical College and New York Presbyterian Hospital. She became Professor Emerita in 2014. Evelyn is a highly respected leader in, child development, in the child development group at Weill Cornell, and under her guidance and through her deft efforts at fundraising, the department grew significantly. Evelyn also published a number of landmark papers in her field. She published a series of studies in the 1990s on the neurodevelopmental outcomes of very low birth weight newborns that highlighted the challenges of some of these infants and their families uh, will face later in life, emphasizing the need for better ways to identify opportunities for early intervention. Early in her career, as Evelyn worked in hospitals and clinic across New York during her residencies, she witnessed the challenges faced by un underserved communities in accessing health care. This experience would influence her career in medicine and also her transformational philanthropy. Evelyn had two sterling role models in philanthropy, her parents, Joseph and Carolyn Groose. Theirs was a remarkable story. Because of their business activities, both Joseph and Carolyn were in the United States in 1939 when Poland closed its borders. Tragically, many members of their family, including their firstborn child, perished in the Holocaust. After Joseph founded the Wall Street firm Grusen Company, he and Carolyn went on to become leading benefactors in international Jewish philanthropy in the late, late 1960s. With a particular focus on education, the Gruses supported hundreds of schools and thousands of students and educators. Schools, child care centers, and medical units across Israel bear the Gruse name. Joseph is noted for having said that his greatest pleasure was to give charity with a warm hand. Evelyn inherited this philosophy. Upon her retirement, she turned her focus and considerable energy to philanthropy, where her, imp her impact has been truly profound. She has advanced the work of distinguished medical, scientific, and humanitarian organizations across the globe. Here at Rockefeller, Evelyn has had enormous impact, perhaps most apparent in her visionary support of innovative technology, which has changed the trajectory of work underway in our laboratories. In 2014, Evelyn's generosity established the Evelyn Groose Lipper Cryoelectron Microscopy Resource Center here at Rockefeller, bringing the university to the forefront of a revolution in structural biology. The story of this gift has become part of the fabric of Rockefeller history and encapsulates Evelyn's approach to philanthropy. The function of every protein in the body is determined by its three-dimensional structure. The first atomic level structures of proteins were determined in 1959 by Perutz and Kendrew by inducing these purified proteins to form a, a crystal lattice and determining the positions of every atom in the protein from the diffraction pattern produced by a beam of x-rays. While extremely informative, inducing proteins to crystallize is at best arduous and time consuming and often impossible, limiting how many of these structures can be deciphered. Advances in electron microscopy and image processing of single protein particles produced a breakthrough that eliminated the need for crystallizing proteins to get high resolution maps of protein structure, dramatically accelerating the understanding of these structures. The method called cryoelectron microscopy and Rockefeller's remarkable structural biology co uh, community was well prepared to use this technology. All that was needed was the resources, which were substantial, to s establish the ex this uh, technology here on campus. Evelyn recognized that this was a game-changing technology and immediately pledged to bring it to Rockefeller. Evelyn's remarkable gift enabled us to establish a spectacular cryo-EM facility on campus, and the impact was immediate and dramatic. By 2017, Rockefeller investigators had published a, more than a dozen papers using, using this revolutionary technology to solve major questions in structural biology in the three most competitive science journals in the world. In comparison, in the same period, uh, the rest of the world collectively had published the same number of papers in these journals. 
Rockefeller scientists have continued to excel in this field with amazing contributions ranging from the structure of the mechanoreceptors for touch in the skin, the structure of the first odorant receptors in insects, uh, the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that one of this year's graduates uh, solved, and its associated helicase. Uh, that has identified opportunities to develop uh, better antiviral drugs, and a remarkable series of studies describing the structure of CFTR, the chloride channel mutated in cystic fibrosis, uh, both the structure of the channel bearing uh, of the native channel, as well as the channel bearing the mutation found in 90% of patients in the U.S., and the structure of the channel bound to the three drugs that allow the channel to fold properly and support the open channel state. These findings have profound implications for uh, how to treat other uh, broken genes. Evelyn's contribution is a wonderful example of how inspired philanthropy put the right technology into the hands of the right scientists at the right time, and the results uh, surpassed the expectations of all involved. This theme has been built upon by our many benefactors throughout the COVID pandemic, enabling our scientists to make critical contributions to understanding the immune response to the virus, prediction of how the virus would evolve to evade the immune system, and identification of inherited and acquired predisposition to severe COVID disease. Evelyn's support of technology on our campus did not end there. She recently made a significant contribution to name the Precision Instrumentation Technologies Resource Center, which allows Rockefeller scientists to design and build the highly innovative instruments that have, for example, enabled our neuroscientists to build the instruments you've heard about that allow them to monitor the activity of specific neurons and circuits in the brains of fish, fruit flies, and mice as they respond to changes in the external environment. I want to note that Evelyn has had an invaluable partner in embracing Rockefeller's technological advancements, her incredibly smart and insightful daughter, Daniela Lipper Cools. In addition to all she has done for Rockefeller, Evelyn has also made highly impactful technology and supporting gifts and served in the leadership of other institutions in biomedicine, including the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, Weill Cornell, and Doctors Without Borders. With years of experience as a pediatric physician scientist, she has also offered a guiding hand to the Children's Television Workshop, New Visions for Public Schools, the New York City Department of Health's Bureau of Daycare, and New York State and New York City Early Intervention Programs. Evelyn's philanthropy also extends to groups such as the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association, Montefiore's Pathways to Healthy Adulthood, the Hebrew uh, Immigrant Aid Society, and Early Starters International. I will not uh, go on with many others. And just as Daniela is a partner in Evelyn's work at Rockefeller, her daughters Joanna, uh, Tamara, and Julie have joined with their mother to advance those causes that most align with their skills and interests. The common thread in all of this work is helping people in need. Evelyn herself explained her approach best when she said, perhaps the most important lesson I've learned as a philanthropist is that it's not simply a matter of giving money away. You have to give it effectively and make an impact. What could be better than advancing work that improves people's health? Just as Evelyn watched and learned from her parents' approach to philanthropy, her four daughters have learned from her. It's the continu continuation of a remarkable legacy. Evelyn, you have been a passionate and insightful leader of Rockefeller for four decades. With a deep understanding of the critical role of, that basic science plays in advancing medicine and patient care, you have been an inspiration for others and a most persuasive champion for Rockefeller and many other institutions. For your many contributions to Rockefeller and to society as a philanthropist and civic leader, we are deeply honored to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa. Evelyn, please come up to receive your hood and diploma. Good afternoon, and thank you, Rick, Bill, the Rockefeller 
Board of Trustees and the faculty for conferring this honor. I'm also grateful to my daughter, Daniela, who um, Rick has spoken of um, in his uh, uh, words uh, previously, who has worked with me in meeting the Rockefeller scientists and choosing the most interesting areas to support. I'm also pleased to receive this honorary degree with Dr. Dubashi and Kirshner, whose work in mathematical and biophysical methods further our advance and understanding of biology and confirm the importance of collaboration among scientists in different fields. I joined the Rockefeller University Board in 1992, one year after Dr. Torsten Wiesel became president. His research in how early visual experiences shaped the cell structure in the retina was an inspiration to me in my career. One of the areas I focused on as a developmental pediatrician was the study of the long-term outcome of premature babies whose first months out of the uterus impacted their development later on compared to infants who were born at term. Their brains lacked the time to fully develop as nature had intended. As a physician on the board, I have most enjoyed engagement with the scientists. As a philanthropist, I have been gratified by the opportunity to collaborate with them to provide key technology to advance breakthroughs in biomedicine. This has been an enduring interest of mine. I first heard about cryo-electron microscopy when Rod McKinnon presented to the board in 2014. The technology had been around for a while, but it had not been sufficiently sensitive. The advent of new detectors was a game changer. The structural biology community was buzzing about two papers that had been published in Nature in December 2013 by the University of California, San Francisco, that showed previously unattainable high-resolution images. The race was on. At the time, only a handful of institutions had them, exacerbating the challenge of procurement were a single manufacturer of the microscope and a dearth of PhD-level personnel with the expertise and experience to operate the equipment. But Rockefeller prevailed, getting its first two cryon-electron microscopes in October 2014, and the third thanks to the generosity of Jim and Marilyn Simons in 2018. The center has been operating 24-7 and is used by nearly 25 labs. There have been so many cryo-EM advances at Rockefeller since the establishment of the center that it is difficult to highlight a subset. Work by Ju Chen on the cystic fibrosis channel and the molecular basis of cystic, fibros cystic fibrosis therapy. Work by Seth Darth on RNA polymerases and their alteration by drugs to, to treat COVID. And the fundamental work by Sebastian Kling on the biosynthesis of ribosomes life's protein synthesis factors. Rob McKinnon uh, discovered a uniquely dome-shaped ion channel that flattens and opens when touched, thereby initiating the sensation and signal to the brain. There have been many, many other advances as well, and there has been no slowdown. I'd like to also just touch upon the endowment and expansion of the Precision Instrument Technologies Resource Center, commonly known as PIT, an on-campus facility where scientists can collaborate with engineers and machinists to design and fabricate custom tools for their experiments. For example, the prevailing method to study the neurophysiology of a fruit fly used to involve immobilization of the fly with aluminum foil and wax. Together with the staff from Pitt, Gabby Maimon was able to design a better fly trap, so to speak. Through an iterative process, they created a tiny magnetic harness to secure the fly's head, leaving its body free to move. 
Then, because the head was tethered, they created a treadmill-like device so the fly could move in place. The tools were transformational. Never before had scientists been able to observe the brain react to stimuli in a fly that was not immobilized. 55% of laboratories and nearly all the neuroscience labs use PIT. Just as Van Leeuwen Hook's lenses engendered the field of microbiology, or advances in computer processing and storage enabled the Human Genome Project, tools and technology have produced biomedical breakthroughs. And I just want to say something to my grandchildren. You think that tethering a fruit fly's head is easy. Take a look at the size of the fruit fly the next time <laughs> they're attacking your banana. <laughs> In conclusion, I am certain that you, the graduating class of 2023, will be part of many miraculous advances in bioscience that will benefit humanity in ways we can only imagine today. Good luck to you all, and thank you, Rockefeller University, for being part of my life over the past 30 years. Thank you, Evelyn. And now we are delighted to honor Dr. Mark Kirshner, a true giant in biomedical science. While describing his career, Mark has quoted Kurt Vonnegut, we are what we pretend to be. Mark claims that he has pretended to be a physical chemist, or a cell biologist, or a biochemist, or an evolutionary biologist, or a systems biologist, and that he's actually fooled everyone in the process. But words like pretending and fooling truly fail to explain Mark's remarkable professional path. His passion for exploring new topics has propelled leaps in multiple spheres of biology. His hundreds of insightful papers elucidate critical functions of microtubules, the regulation of the eukaryotic cell cycle, mechanisms of embryonic development, evolution, and systems biology. He stands out for the tremendous scope and number of his accomplishments, and also for his propensity to break new ground and then hand off paradigm-shifting findings to a talented trainee. While some might refer to him as having an eclectic laboratory, uh, it really comes across as someone who has too many ideas to execute himself, and so he gives them away and goes on to the next great idea. Mark was born and grew up in Chicago to parents who did not understand their son's interest in learning how everything worked. Nevertheless, they supported him and vicariously beamed at his enjoyment of trips to the planetarium and science museums. When he was eight, the family vacationed at the Indiana Sand Dunes. His enthusiasm for the organized nature hikes and desire to identify all 350 species of birds in the park impressed the on-site naturalist and earned Mark an introduction to the president of the National Audubon Society when he came through with a group of bird watchers. They took Mark under their wing and invited him to accompany them on their forays. Mark soon proved to be incorrigible. His seventh grade librarian threatened to flunk him because the only books he took out were about science, but that did not slow him down. The following year, the launch of Sputnik changed everyone's attitude about science. Suddenly, even the librarian thought Mark was on the right track. After receiving a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Northwestern, Mark enrolled in graduate school, surprisingly, here at Rockefeller. But he did not graduate. After a while, resistance to the Vietnam War, he realized, was raging across the country, and it was centered in California. Young men were burning draft cards, and protests were erupting all over. Mark was restless, and California seemed like the place to be, so he dropped out, moved to Berkeley, got involved in the free speech movement, and wound up in graduate school there. In 1971, he completed his PhD on allosteric proteins with Howard Schachman at University of California, Berkeley. Rather than doing a standard postdoc, Mark spent a year in the lab of John Gerhardt, who became a lifelong collaborator and preeminent scientific influence. 
During this period, Dr. Kirshner read the original edition of E.B. Wilson's The Cell in Development and Inheritance, which hooked him on the process of mitosis. He also commented that the field hadn't progressed much since 1896. It might have been an insult to people who were currently working in the field, but that didn't seem to, to bother him too much. Contemplating his future, Mark pondered how to study mitosis in frog eggs. Unfortunately, his training in biophysical chemistry and enzymology did not appear to be an obvious fit. A distinguished faculty member pointed him toward a paper that proposed that tubulin proteins serve as the building blocks of microtubules, and these comprise the mitotic spindle. Dr. Kirshner noticed that the authors had never tried to assemble microtubules. Presumably, some critical factor was missing to allow this assembly to proceed in vitro. Maybe his background uh, could be useful after all. He was recruited to Princeton and pursued his problem, this problem there. At Princeton, he discovered numerous critical characteristics of microtubules and corrected misconceptions about the influence of GTP hydrolysis and other issues. Tubulin subunits combine to, perform, to form microtubules through a surprising mechanism. Rather than generating helical rods spontaneously like other polymers, they create sheets that then fold into cylinders. He identified the first protein that induces tubulin pro polymerization, a protein called tau, whose unfolded form would later prove to play a crucial role in Alzheimer's disease and a Mendelian form of dementia. The pattern of spread of neurofibrillary tangles composed of tau in Alzheimer's disease is stereotypical and is currently a major target for trying to prevent the uh, progression of Alzheimer's disease and related forms of neurodegeneration. This is a beautiful example of what started out as fundamental basic science that has had years later unanticipated impact on the understanding of a critical human disease. In 1977, he left Princeton to accept a job offer at the University of California, San Francisco. However, before moving, he and Dr. Gerhardt took a sabbatical together in the Netherlands. They figured out how the fertilized frog egg establishes the location of the animal's front and back, a study that unexpectedly established the role of gravity in the process. Dr. Kirshner has made additional major contributions to the field of development, in part by developing and using dominant negative mutations uh, to probe protein function in multicellular organisms. At UCSF, Mark unearthed more surprises. With graduate student Tim Mitchison, he discovered that microtubules are unexpectedly dynamic structures, constantly adding and removing tubulin monomers at opposite ends. This dynamic instability allows cells to rapidly reorganize their cytoskeletons and allows them to constantly explore cellular space to find targets to bind to. It's in this way that they find and connect to the linker proteins that connects microtubules to chromosomes in the mitotic spindle, preparing one member of pairs of replicated chromosomes to be pulled to opposite ends of a cell, ensuring that cell division produces two daughter cells that each have a full complement of chromosomes. Dr. Kirshner also showed from analysis of time-lapse images of early development of frog eggs that the cell cycle is not a rigid assembly line process in which each successive step only occurs after a prior step has been completed. For example, he showed that despite poisoning microtubule function and chromosome segregation, these defective cells nonetheless go through cytokinesis, the cytoplasmic division of one cell into two, in synchrony with unpoisoned unpo cells that were completing the cell cycle normally. His work on regulation of the cell cycle has been highly influential, with contributions including the demonstration of new cyclin protein synthesis driving the cell cycle forward, and cyclin degradation by ubiquitolation and degradation by the proteasome draws one cycle to a close. This led to his discovery of the anaphase promoting complex, a molecular machine that plays additional key roles in the cell cycle. Dr. Kirshner moved to Harvard in 1993 to launch their Department of Cell Biology, where he became interested in using mathematical modeling to understand how the components of a system dynamically interact over time to produce surprising outcomes, as exemplified by his analysis of the Wnt signaling pathway. This ultimately led to his founding of yet another Harvard department, the first Department of Systems Biology. 
Along the way, he also became interested in evolvability, the importance of biological systems that have the capacity to generate variation in inherited traits that can provide the substrate upon which natural selection can act. He and Dr. Gerhardt wrote two books on this topic, Cells, Embryos, and Evolution, and The Plausibility of Life, Resolving Darwin's Dilemma. Dr. Kirshner has been a remarkable mentor to an extraordinary number of scientists who have gone on to highly impactful careers. These include Tim Mitchison, Andrew Murray, Don Cleveland, Bruce Spiegelman, Ray Deshaies, Ellie Tanaka, David Durbin, and Rockefeller's own Tim Stearns. 54 of Mark's former students and postdocs are tenured professors at leading academic institutions. 18 others hold uh, senior positions in industry. Nine of his scientific progeny have been elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, and one is also a member of the Royal Society. When we think about careers, we often think about what legacy has been left behind. Mark's legacy is enormous. Mark has also been a strong public advocate for federal funding for science. He was a founder and first chair of the Joint Steering Committee for Public Policy, which brought together scientific societies to jointly educate Cong attempt to educate Congress about the conduct of science and advocate for the importance of federal funding for the nation's health and economic progress. Part of this effort has and continues to be lunchtime presentations by scientists on their current research that is of particular interest to members of Congress and their staffs. Many people in our audience today have given these presentations. Mark has also raised concerns about the hyper-competitive nature of science and the dramatic growth of the size of academic science faculty at major research institutions. From the perspective, I have to say, of an institution whose faculty has remained about 70 for over 30 years, we appreciate your perspective very much. <laughs> Dr. Kirshner's many honors include membership in the National Academy of Sciences, and foreign membership in the Royal Society of London, as well as the Gairdner Foundation International Award and the American Society for Cell Biology's Public Service Award. Mark, we celebrate you today for your boundless curiosity and recognition of major unsolved problems, which has led to fundamental discoveries of cell division and embryonic development and development of systems biology as an important field of inquiry. You have a restless intellect uh, that is always looking for the next great idea, and you find them far more often than uh, chance would suggest is possible. You have been a visionary intellectual leader of the direction of science and a shaper of departments and institutions and a remarkable and generous mentor to your trainees. You are ex an, a, a tremendous exemplar for all of us here today. It's a great privilege for us to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa. Mark, please come, come up to get your hood in the front. That was too much, but it was wonderful. Uh, but it really uh, applies to what we saw, her, saw and heard today, and that is uh, the tremendous amount of creativity of young people and the commitment of the older people to guide them and to promote them uh, and to encourage them and to fund them. So this was a, a wonderful day for me to see all the things that I most uh, favor and uh, uh, to be um, uh, illustrated in such graphic terms. Now, first I want to congratulate the graduates. I mean, this was, this is really a moment of accomplishment. It's wonderful to hear your mentors speak about your journey through graduate school. You each had to confront the vagaries of experiment and theory find novel solutions for unexpected problems, 
and do all of this in a world beset by a global pandemic. Of course, no one succeeds alone. Parents, friends, and partners help make this day possible. And let's also recognize your mentors and teachers. They inspired you, guided you, sheltered you, and shared their knowledge freely. As we reflect on what this day signifies, it's perhaps helpful to think of science more generally. Science is fundamentally a collective enterprise and in that way differs from many other creative pursuits. When we think about art, for example, we think about individuals. We revere the paintings of Van Gogh, the music of Beethoven, the choreography of Alvin Ailey, the poetry of Emily Dickinson. On the placards at museums, in the alphabetical organization of library shelves, on the scrolls of film credits, we focus on names. Who did what? But science is different. When you go to a science museum, the focus is almost always on the general sweep of discoveries and rarely on those who made them. To be sure, we scientists have our moments of individual joy and recognition, and we certainly saw this today, and it was, it was very rewarding. At the same time, we know that our work will be subsumed by what comes next. We pave a path for others to follow. And that was also well examined today. Perhaps a fitting metaphor for the scientists is that of the talented but anonymous artisans who built beautiful monumental structures like medieval cathedrals, Indian temples, or Mayan pyramids. These workers use their artistry in the service of something bigger, something they only played a part in. We too are artisans, adding to our contribution to arguably the greatest construction project in human history, an edifice of insight into the physical and natural world. We build, in, uh, we build as artisans, but in science, unlike a cathedral, there is no roof that signifies the end of construction. We build and build, generation after generation, stretching ever further into the unknown. For those most familiar with fields that highlight individual achievement, it must seem strange to see a profession in which even towering individual contributions are so quickly subordinated to common goals. But science requires that, because where there is open collaboration and the free exchange of ideas, the trail of discovery is often murky, but the progress is more swift. Science is ultimately about being part of a community and one that is strengthened by our individual differences. To quote the immunologist Peter Medawar, scientists are people of very similar temperaments, doing different things in very different ways. Among scientists are collectors, classifiers, and compulsive tidiers up. Many are detectives by temperament, and many are explorers. Some are artisans, and others are, are artists. There are poet scientists and philosopher scientists and even a few mystics. And then Medawar asked, what sort of mind or temperament do all these scientists have in common? I believe the answer is rooted in dedication to a kind of inquiry where we each allow ourselves to dream and where wild inspirations overwhelm the rigidity of our more circumscribed thinking. Those of us who love science know that at its best, it's about playing and, impro and improvising, sort of like a cross between children on a playground and a jam session of jazz musicians. When I look back at my career, I cherish most of this common spirit of curiosity and free exchange of ideas. Institutions like Rockefeller are incubators for what science can and should be. We as a society need to find ways to ensure that there will always be such places committed to freedom of exploration without guarantee of success. As you graduates go forth into lives and career, may you find comfort and support from an open, global, scientific community 
And may you find ways to keep your own curiosity alive. You have already demonstrated that you can expand the horizons of human knowledge. We can't wait to see what you discover in the future as you forge into this wonderful world. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Ingrid Dobshi. When a project seems impossible, Ingrid Dobshi assumes that there must be a way to make it work. This attitude has melded with her intellect, creativity, and collaborative zeal to fuel an astounding career. Reliably inspired rather than daunted, Dr. Dobshi has broken new ground in mathematics. She has transformed methods for processing images, signals, and other data, and has fostered progress in a vast range of fields. Ingrid was born in Hauthalin, Belgium, and she spent much of her childhood crafting doll outfits and furniture. She figured out how to deploy different types of sewing darts to create desired shapes from cloth, and when she couldn't fall asleep, she'd count by powers of two. This may have presaged what was to come. Ingrid's father, a mining engineer who would have liked to be a physicist, had answers when his relentlessly curious daughter asked relentlessly, how come? Her mother was a homemaker and a force of nature. She routinely pushed back nose and took matters into her own hands, something that Ingrid learned to do as well. She gets things done even if they're not her job. Ingrid once bought paint and rallied her students to spend the weekend slapping it on the walls of a building whose remodeling was not yet complete, thus brightening the dreariness that everyone had been complaining about. It's a weekend progress for the faculty to take on uh, tomorrow. Ingrid studied physics as an undergraduate at the Free University of Brussels, where she also earned her PhD in theoretical physics in 1980. She continued her research career there until 1987, when she joined AT&T Bell Labs in New Jersey. That same year, she published the work that drew her international fame. Its origin maps to the early 1800s, when Joseph Fourier realized that he could build almost any periodic function by adding sines and cosines of different wavelengths in, different wa in various ways. This technique found many applications, but it's mathematically expensive for signals with sudden dramatic changes, for instance, images with a crack in a smooth sur surface. In the latter half of the 20th century, an innovation called wavelets provided a way to zoom in to where details matter and zoom out where the signal is more uniform. With wavelets as building blocks, mathematicians could now target computer memory to where the action is. For example, where there is least a uniformity in an image. For example, imagine a field of grass, a uniform landscape with little variation of interest, except for the, the cow standing in the middle of the field. As a result, wavelets provide an efficient way to compress information uh, in many data storage applications. Little resolution is required to capture the essence of the field of grass, but high resolution is needed for the cow, where there's great variation in a small area. As people translated wavelets into practical tools, they made many approximations. And this process destroyed some beautiful mathematical properties, but most mathematicians accepted the resulting messiness. Conventional wisdom held that applications necessarily corrupt theoretical elegance. Dr. Dobji did not like this doctrine. And true to form, she thought that she might manage to render a recent wavelet advance amenable to application without wrecking the underlying mathematics. She insisted from the start that her algorithm retain all the underlying mathematics while it also possessed practical properties that she sought. 
Thus, she constructed the foundation for what grew into a family of Dr. Daubshi's wavelets, each suited to a different task, but especially useful in digital applications. These wavelets had several desired characteristics, including graceful degradation of image quality. For example, they produce the best picture possible under a given transmission bandwidth constraints. For example, when a connection falters, the image blurs, but it doesn't freeze. Dr. Dobshi wanted to reach people who could use her work even if they could not follow the math, so she persuaded the journal that was publishing her work to give her space to present the potential applications. Other papers in the same issues were 12 to 17 pages long. Hers was 88 pages long. She laid out tables of ready-to-use numbers so that engineers and others could easily exploit them and see that doing so produced interesting, if not amazing, results. Eventually, Dr. Dobshi's wavelets found their way into a wide scope of technical arenas. For example, they underlie the algorithms we use every day, such as the JPEG 2000 image compression standard and coding systems that pervade the, the digital age. Dr. Dobshi enjoys listening to people explain where they're stuck, and she then digs into devised solutions. Her favorite collaborations, she says, are always the ones on which she's currently working. She has harnessed wavelets and other mathematical tools to help geologists and neuroscientists analyze seismic and brain signals. She's teamed up with fossil experts to trace evolutionary changes and partnered with art historians to virtually restore missing portions of the famous Ghent altarpiece. Their reconstruction, in fact, showed that a book in that painting was not merely symbolic with squiggles for letters, but rather was a miniature version of a text by the Italian theologian Thomas Aquinas. This revelation held significance for understanding the scene in that masterpiece. Her penchant for collaborating with people in far-flung disciplines has also manifested in a traveling museum piece called Mathemalchemy that celebrates the relationship between math and art. With fiber artist Dominique Ehrman, Dr. Dobshi conceived and spearheaded this show, which explores the fun, beauty, and creativity of mathematics. The whimsical exhibit includes a cat that, break, that bakes Greek letter pie-shaped cookies that, are, that can be arranged in a tessellated pattern, one that completely covers the surface with no spaces or overlap. It's a pie-shaped, uh, uh, pie, you get it. Dr. Dobshi <laughs> has earned numerous honors and distinctions. She received a MacArthur Fellowship in 1992, a so-called uh, Genius Grant, and two years later, Princeton University made her its first tenured female professor of mathematics. In 2000, she won the National Academy of Sciences Award in Mathematics, another first for a woman, and she became the first female president of the International Mathematical Union in 2011. Earlier this year, she won the Wolf Prize in Mathematics, which recognizes achievements in the interest of humanity and friendly relations among people. Dr. Dobshi has not only served as a model for aspiring female mathematicians, but she has also established programs to foster their interest and success. At Duke University, where she has been a faculty member since 2011, she co-founded a summer workshop in mathematics for rising female high school seniors, and she serves on the board of directors of the EDGE Foundation, which seeks to diversify the mathematics community. Ingrid Dobshi, your brilliant and influential discoveries in time frequency analysis and their diverse applications have underscored the power of mathematics to improve and transform technology. We salute you and your unwavering dedication to mentoring future generations of mathematicians, particularly for young women, to increase their representation and opportunities in mathematical science. It is indeed an honor to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa. Ingrid, please rise to receive your hood and diploma. Thank <laughs> you.
I could almost quote Mark and saying, uh, I was too much, but it was beautiful. <laughs> uh, in fact, I could quote Mark for a lot, so I'll be, I'll be uh, a little bit shorter than I was intending to be. Uh, but also, I'm the last, uh, uh, the last, the last thing between this and, and, and walking out, so <laughs> I really shouldn't be long. Um, so, Rockefeller, I had heard that Rockefeller was a unique place, and today I really saw how it is. Uh, the presentation of, of each student by uh, their mentor was beautiful. Now, I realize that there are many places where it can't be done because the number of students are too large, but it's a fantastic thing, and it was really very impressive and wonderful to see the appreciation of all you fantastic graduates by your mentors. I mean, uh, I was really touched, and I was also touched by uh, how, how enthusiastic it was done in prose or in rhyme. And uh, to, to, uh, to celebrate your, your scientific findings, uh, which are findings of first order, I mean, uh, discovering and studying new mechanisms of disease transmission and development, and targeting possible therapies. Uh, imaging of human and also and brains, uh, uh, the geometry of the dynamics in large populations, uh, probing into uh, uh, scientific computational algorithms and processing that the brain is doing. I mean, so many, and I'm only listing a few, I was, was taking notes, but uh, uh, it's fantastic work. You're clearly all fantastic young scientists, and you have wonderful mentors, and also don't forget your peers. I mean, and that's something that I, I uh, 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 that that you have demonstrated, and that was repeatedly uh, said over and over again that your openness to ideas, your openness to others, your mentoring of younger students in 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 the lab was already very apparent, and I would encourage you to keep that up for the rest of your careers. It's so important. Because as, as Mark has said, collaboration is really the essence of science. And uh, there are moments that we have to be by ourselves, that we have to kind of tease out the tendrils of the hunch that we have in our, 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 our mind and so on, but there are moments that we have to explain our partial understanding to others and get more ideas from that. And that is what I myself have found the most uh, uh, exhilarating in, in, in my scientific career. Uh, times where uh, you really try to understand things that other people know how to do and try to understand their problems and then try together to make more. And uh, it's, it's uh, the, 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 all the things, the enthusiasm, the hard work, that, that you have put in the can-do attitude to help in getting uh, labs established, uh, the attention to detail, focus, but also not losing the big picture. You have already so many of the, of the attributes that, uh, uh, and shown those in, in your thesis work. And uh, I am so hopeful for your future because I think you will find all these attributes so important in, as you go on to your career. Um, I have probably most of my career behind me. I mean, not everything. I'm not quite uh, counted out. Uh, you're at the start, so um, make the best of it. Evelyn Lipper, Ingrid Dobshi, Mark Kirshner, would you please rise? Now, by the authority of the Regents of the New England Commission of Higher Education, which have vested in the trustees of the Rockefeller University uh, and is by them delegated to me, I now confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science honoris causa, which admits you to all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you.
you. Graduates, honorary degree recipients, Chairman Bill Ford, faculty, staff, this concludes the 65th convocation of the Rockefeller University. On behalf of the graduates and honorands, I'd like to invite everyone now to a reception on the lawn outside the Avi Aldrich Rockefeller Hall immediately after we leave. Please remain standing at your seats until the marchers have exited the auditorium. Once outside the auditorium, the graduates and honorary degree recipients, along with everyone else on the stage and the faculty presenters, uh, will assemble for a class photograph on the steps uh, of uh, Founders Hall or the hospital? The hospital, thank you. Following the photograph, the uh, graduates will join their families and friends at the reception. And now I ask that everyone rise. <laughs> Thank you.